the things we're going to talk about are cover a wide range of different types of presentations, right? right? right. There's kind of the academic school setting for designers and, and to be architects. That's one form of presentation, usually to a jury. There's a presentation given if you're a guest lecturer at a school or at a conference and whatnot. Um, and then there's client presentations. There's of all course, different kinds yeah, of presentations, yeah, yeah. but I think the principles we're going to talk about probably apply to, to most of them, I think, right? I think so. I think I think so. Okay, we'll find out. <laughs> no, I think so. I mean, you know, there is like key things to cover for any of those presentations. So, right. Yeah. I think one of the first things you have to recognize as a presenter is what is why are you giving the presentation? So there's like two different outcomes that you're looking for, I feel. One is that there there are presentations you give because you're trying to learn something from the process. An easy example would be like at a school review, a design review, you present your project, you get feedback, and you're meant to be learning, right? That's slightly you different. You mean like a, like a desk crit? Sort of. I mean, like, yeah. Right. It's right. like a constructive presentation. Right. Well, it's right. like, what are you trying to get out of it? Are you trying to, to learn out of this process as the presenter and get feedback from people that's helpful to you? Or are you trying to convince the audience that whatever you're pitching is the greatest thing ever and, and you're trying to win? Right. Right. So, so in my mind, there's there's either you're trying to learn or you're trying to win over the audience. Right. right? And I'm not saying that if you're trying to win over the audience, you can't learn. And I'm not sorry. I'm not saying that if you are trying to your primary objective is to learn something, you can't also win over the audience. But I think there's slightly different mentalities. And I think that before you you enter a scenario, you have to think about what is the purpose of this thing I'm 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 doing right now. You, you right. know what I mean? Right. 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 Well, let's say you have a client meeting. Right. right, that it is about like brainstorming and trying to get their ideas on what they want to do with their project. That is more of like a kind of like what you're saying, like a discussion slash constructive presentation, where you might pitch some ideas that might win them, right, and some that you might discover by presenting things to them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and also I think in terms of client relationships, we've all, we've all done the thing where like you show three options and the one that's the best you spend the most time on, right? And you're catering the presentation for a certain outcome because you're trying to win, win as in get in your, get your way. Right. right? So really and, you have to know what, what is your goal by doing this presentation? Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and for students, like it's a difference between, let's say a mid review and a final review. Of course. Mid review, you, your objective as the presenter is not really to win. It's more to get whatever information you need that's going to help you do the best project in the remaining time of right. the semester or quarter. And a final review, you are trying to learn from the mistakes that you've made that are going to be revealed in the presentation process. But it's more of like, I'm just trying to convince everyone that I'm great, especially let's say if it's the final review of your final year it has a different right, tone right. to it. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, that is an important thing to realize because I think I see a lot of people, they enter a situation where really the whole thing is about learning and instead they're trying to, to win. Right. Right. And sometimes that, that mentality doesn't work because then you're not open to flaws, right? You're not opening to you're not open to saying like I made a mistake in what I've presented, and I can learn from it to from it to move forward. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you you, you it it's again like I said, it's constructive. Right? <clears throat> right. It's, it's like it's an exchange type of presentation. Yeah. Where really the winning presentation is more like here it is. You like it, you don't like it. <laughs> no, that's true. It, sure. It's it, the, the the work is has been done. Right. So mm -hmm. it's not yes. so much that that presentation is going to help you to do the work. It's the you're judging the work that has been done. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's, it's more like we're showing you something that's completed and we mainly just want to get uh, publicity out of this, look good and convince everyone that we can do more great projects. It's different from from when you're in the middle right. of something. Right. Um, so there's that. And I think the, the two different types of formats that we're going to talk about mainly are the slideshow format mm -hmm. and the board format where you have a bunch of physical boards i suppose they could be digital but big boards behind you and there's multiples of them and it's a layout kind of situation versus a slideshow which is one slide at a time powerpoint or pdf or whatever right right and it's kind of weird because like okay for when you were in school um did you do mostly slideshow format presentations or boards for like architecture presentations let's say per studio 
or for whatever? I think for studio, we only did a uh, board presentation. Right. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, it was mo it was only board presentation. The only like PowerPoint slideshow ones would be for like other classes in studio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, the slideshow has become much more popular in uh, design education. Slideshows are right. super common in uh, the professional setting of working with a client because there's a conference room, there's a giant flat screen TV, and you throw in a PDF and you walk through the slides with them and maybe there's some printed out drawings and stuff. Um, well, and their, their, their attention and their familiarity with architecture presentation is small. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it's the most digested format out of the two in a it, way. It could be. It right? could be. I mean, obviously, in the, in the professional sense, you, you, there's, it's all over the place. It depends on the context, right? You, but you I, could but also I, have boards. For yeah, clients, yeah, 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 for sure. But I will say in, in the education, in the academic setting, slideshows have become much, much more common. And it's kind of a weird thing because when I went to school, it was always boards. I think we only did slideshows in my final year. And that's that's to do with the nature of that particular t teacher in the studio, yes, but also the change and shift in technology. you know. And now when I go to... Uh, presentations at schools it's almost always uh, a slideshow and um so we're going to kind of talk about the differences between the slideshow and boards because they're very very different formats there's pros and cons to each and i personally from an in terms of learning from an educational standpoint i really despise the slideshow i think it's it's interesting i'm trying to think like you know uh when we were working in offices in new york like clients presentation if we ever did boards and I think oftentimes it would be a slideshow because these were like process meetings with the client mm -hmm. right to try and move the design further and further and further so you you just look at ideas by ideas and then maybe like when you're close to be wrapped up with like the schematics or the DD you pin up stuff on the wall that shows like renderings or like a big floor plan or like some sketches or some diagrams just so they could have an an overall view of their project right right and the slideshow is actually a, a printed booklet that the client lives with so what well, you're saying you guys actually printed the slideshow or are you using yeah. that okay so they could have a support where they navigate the slideshow to refer to and take the slideshow back with them after they leave Okay, so you were doing a slideshow presentation with a printed booklet in front of them too, or you... the slideshow presentation is the printed booklet. Okay, okay, which is interesting way to think about it because it is actually a book that we look up on the screen mm -hmm. instead of being a true slideshow where you're never going to see that first slide again. Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, let's jump into the slideshow stuff. So there are some basic ideas that I have. I think one of the, the tricky things with slideshows is that obviously you're looking at one slide at a time and that slide might have multiple graphics show up over time, like in a PowerPoint, mm -hmm. or it might have a bunch of things on at once. doesn't matter. It's one slide at a time. And let's say you're talking about a slideshow that's around 80 slides, so a pretty robust thing, not like oh, a 10 page. God. Yeah. Um, and I mean, obviously the length varies on your audience, but you know if it's if it's a most of the lectures that i've been to within our world like they're not 10 page slideshows you know like you read things online like don't go over 20 pages from a slideshow like i don't believe i don't believe in that it's like well it depends on the topic right i mean you might need more than depends 20 what's on your slide depends on what you're on your slide. yeah that's true too if there is just a dot on the slide well maybe you don't <laughs> need 80 dots it's a, no it's a dot and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and over 80 it's slides conceptual presentation so it's easy i think for audience members to get lost in a slideshow because there's no sense of beginning middle and end most of the time like you were saying with a physical book that's 80 pages i know where i am in those 80 pages because i feel and i see the book in a new in a new presentation that someone's uh, uh, seeing and it's a digital slideshow and there's no markers or anything like that you're flying through stuff and after the first 15 minutes and in, into an hour-long presentation i i have a sense of time so i know how far we are but i'm also kind of wondering like how many slides are left like where am i in space uh, this is a weird comparison but it's the same thing as like a kindle versus a physical book right sometimes it's nice to know like where you are 
in the story that you're in the ride that you're going along for. It is very strange, actually, when you read a book on a Kindle, you do not know you do not know how far along you are in the story. You don't. It's disturbing. It's disturbing. So that's what I'm saying. As an audience member, it's a little bit it's it's a little bit uncomfortable and I think it, it kind of maybe can cause confusion. So an easy fix would be uh, I think having chapters are good. I mean, first of all, you can't have all the slides feel monotonous, right? So I think having chapters to help them understand, like this is the presentation is going to be structured this way. So when we get to chapter two, they know I'm at chapter two out of five. I have a, I have a rough sense of like how far we have to go. So chapters and some kind of outline at the beginning. Yes. So they kind of know yeah. the journey through the presentation. I think it's a good idea. And look, these rules don't apply to, to every presentation. And and there are certainly ways to not have an outline and have a very successful presentation. But I think generally, um, presentations who uh, do this, uh, it, it helps the audience gauge where they're going. Right. Because I think one of the biggest problems that audience members have and therefore the presenter has is the people listening getting confused and lost right because if you're an audience member and something about the presentation causes you to get kind of confused maybe they said something weird or there's a strange slide or we're lost because there's no markers or whatever else my focus goes away from the presentation now I'm thinking about I'm trying to problem-solve the thing I'm confused about right and it causes a kind of a gap in the journey so like the story keeps getting told meanwhile as an audience member i'm still on i'm stuck on that slide trying to figure out that particular thing that i didn't understand i think and it's, it's hard also, to get jump back on the train right that's true and i think it's also helpful if like you have questions as an audience mm -hmm. to kind of know when is best to ask the question like you might have a question that happens now but you know in the next chapter you know he's going to be talking about like concept well right. maybe the question would be better waiting to see what he has said about the concept mm -hmm. before you ask it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so i i think it's a good idea to have chapters for the sanity of the people and also it just keeps everyone a little more grounded i feel like because it's also i don't know i've been to some presentation and i'm like okay i've been sitting here for half an hour i still don't know where we're going what is the it. point right. where are we going that's the title of the lecture and i still we're not there yet so mm -hmm. how much more is there to that you know yeah. and then i just start getting impatient and then i just lose interest and then that's it i'm gone right 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 <laughs> but that's the thing so maybe another big hurdle maybe the greatest one of presentation is you're trying to there's like a space between you and the audience right a space or a wall some kind of division and basically you're trying to er eradicate that the more transparency that they that there is and that they feel and that you feel the stronger the presentation is and confusion is one of those things that it, it can happen when there's when that threshold is is too established and you haven't figured a way to be kind of just open and clear with them right, right? you want them to be thinking what you're thinking you want to be on the same you want to be in sync with them and confusion doesn't help with that back to the slideshow also it's a very basic thing but do not go back and forth between slides oh. a bunch of times. And it happens to a lot of presenters, especially if they aren't prepared. They get to a slide and they forget where they are or they go forward too soon and then they go back. I mean, everyone's been in a as an audience member and seen a presentation where they do that. It's like super jarring, right? It's like, what what just happened here? <laughs> it's like if you're playing like replay or fast forward on a movie and you're like, what? Yeah, there's a what? glitch. I, you know, yeah, you can't do that. No, it's... It's disturbing to the the flawlessness of the presentation. Mm -hmm. Because again, we're already as an audience member, we're already lost. We're already floating kind of around in like all these slides. And again, if it's a long presentation and we're at slide forty five, man, I have no fucking idea where I've been. And now we're going back and forth because you, as the presenter, you know where back and forth is. They don't, right? right. And so if you hop back a few, it's completely wrecked their sense of stability and and, and trajectory right? Right, right and on that note um i uh I, I was at a seminar where a speech coach coach was giving a workshop and actually we're going to have her on the show we were supposed to have her on the show before covid she was going to come over and everything and then covid happened so but we might have her on remotely anyway 
she had a lot of good advice, but one of the things she did that I thought was really fascinating, you know, the, the format we was a classroom kind of format. So it was like, you know, 20 of us, small space, flat screen TV in an office, and she's going through slides and presenting. Incredibly well-spoken, as you'd imagine. But questions would come up during the presentation. It was this kind of format. And I don't know how she did it, but anytime a question came up, she would change the TV to be a black slide, like just blank. Maybe she just turned off the TV. <laughs> and then she would answer the question. And then when, when that discussion was over, she would go back to either the next slide or the slide that she was on to continue what she right. was saying. And it was such a powerful move because if you imagine, listener, that you're an audience member and you're at a slideshow presentation, and what happens is when someone injects with a question and they stop, either they're on the slide they were already at and everyone's looking at old information, or they've moved to the next slide, which is common because the question comes in between. And now everyone in the audience is actually staring at this new slide. Right. A lot of people are trying to figure out, like, what is this about? And they're not really thinking about the conversation that's happening, which is really important. So when this woman changed it to a black slide, you could I could see, because I was in the back, you could see everyone in the audience shift their view from the TV over to her. And there was a, a an incredibly strong connection with her as a presenter because she just erased this distraction for a brief moment. I have to ask her when we Imagine have her on the show. Imagine doing a client meeting. Client's like, uh, what, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> well, that might be a little bit confusing, but it was, it was kind of a, a powerful. It's thing. interesting, and I think it, you know, it just makes me realize that when you do a presentation, you almost have to role play. You know, that's something that we mentioned a few times, right? You kind of have to pretend that you are presenting the news or something, right? Mm -hmm. You're like a. a uh, a broadcaster or something you you have to be dynamic with your audience you have to like move and cover the whole room you can't just mm -hmm. be staring at the same person you have to be interactive know where your tools are know the timing of things right yeah and know your lines without having to look at the prompter and, and stuff like that yeah you have to know your stuff so well and this goes back to like our portfolio discussion we did an episode on how to well, we did an episode on how to create a portfolio, and we did an episode on how to interview. Right. And we had said during the interview episode on this show that the that the the interview, the portfolio is a presentation of your work, right? right? It's not a book, it's a presentation, it's a slideshow presentation, sort of. And yeah, you have to know yourself really, really well so you can, I don't know if you would jump slides, but so you can maneuver easily and kind of like see the bigger view. And I, I do think that if people were to ask questions in the middle of a slideshow, and it's appropriate, right? They're not protesting or something, that um, you got to answer them. I've seen a lot of presentations, slideshow or not. I hate that. Right? Where's, well, uh, we'll, we'll get to questions at the end. Yeah. Or, Save your thought. Or or it's not even it's not even that. It's it's like, oh, I'm going to answer that in like two minutes. And they're, and they're not. And, uh, and they're not. And they're not. <laughs> right, right. Oftentimes they just, you know, get distracted and go back on the track they were on and completely forgot about the question. And again, I think you just lost the audience. I think you need to answer them. I mean, you know, there are some situations where literally the next slide you're about to answer, well, that's that's different. Right. But a lot of times it's it, it comes across as being like, no, 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 excuse me. I will tell you when you can ask questions and I'm in control here. Right. You know, it's not a good... It's not a good look, and it's a strange thing as a presenter that you, you need to kind of exude a range of emotions, uh, you know, confident and et cetera, et cetera. But also, you don't want to come across as a dick. <laughs> you know, like, like, um, like th there's a certain amount of like rapport you need to have with the audience, and they need to feel like, like, I think you, you can get an audience member to think that they could go and have a beer with you and it'd be a good time. Like, that's one of the things you have to try and convey. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I don't know. You have to seem approachable, and you're right, not there as, as if they were not. Yes. Right. Exactly. Like, the, the presence of your audience is there because of you, and you're there because of them. So mm -hmm. none exists without the other. Yeah, and it's almost like you have to imagine that, like you said, you are them. So when you start off in the presentation, we're starting f together from a, a shared point. Right. And we're going to go on this journey together, which means that I'm not it's different from me saying, like, I already know everything and let me lecture you and kind of maybe come across condescending 
and you and so then therefore as an audience member you're always playing catch up because i know a little bit more than you and that's right. different from saying from having the attitude and conveying like we're going to start together and, and move throughout this thing and navigate i think it just goes back to like if you're a teacher right like right. if you take a classroom you're not you you're there to kind of encourage people to participate and mm -hmm. and learn something and you're open to the questions they might have and all of that right i mean we've all had like really terrible lecturers either at conferences or as teachers and it's like could you be any worse at your job <laughs> you know that's like your job is is half performance really and you're failing at half so you get an f <laughs> If it you're is. Give me and, I, and, I, and I think <laughs> I think you know it's a matter of being organized like you say right. having chapters an outline you know be aware of time but also being clear mm, that's a tough one right like being clear what you have to say uh, you know like I've been to presentation on for projects or, or lectures where there's just too much stuff on the slide and I just don't know what I'm supposed to be looking at you know, I don't know wh wh where to start. Am I supposed to dissect that slide? Or is he going to explain it? Like, so I think clarity and like almost like baby steps, right? Like maybe one idea per slide mm. is better than like many ideas on one slide. To try to avoid having eighty slides mm -hmm. might not benefit the attention and and you know the audience it just depends on how long you're, you're going to stay on one slide that's all you know you can have a slide with a bunch of stuff and you stand for 10 minutes it's okay most would argue that a, the slideshow format that's digital the advantage is you can have a large number of slides it doesn't really affect anything other than file size which you should right. be aware of i mean that's always a fucking problem like you get your presentation and someone has a file size that's like 900 megabytes for a pdf and it's you know 30 pages like bro what that, are you doing or like you can open it because it's <laughs> yeah. not saved or you know like technical things but uh as far as how much information per slide um i think there's this is both the strength and weakness of the slideshow is that you can really pare down information so it, you can make it so it's not even one idea per slide. It's like one tenth of an idea per slide, you know, IK, AKA diagram, right? And then the next one is the next is two out of 10, then three out of 10, four, and then finally 10. And that can be super effective as a way of kind of storytelling, right? Or seeing things evolve. But I think, and this is, this gets back to needing rhythm in a presentation. So the one tenth of an idea approach I think works is can be super effective but i wouldn't recommend doing that for the entire yeah. thing you need to create the feeling of rhythm of passages that are repetitive passages that, that rise and fall gaps you know suspense speed speed all of these things and that's where you have to be aware there are some slides that yeah you should slide through you should fly through because they're acting almost like a frames in a movie and others you just have to stop right right because again, like you were saying, there's a there's a big difference between what I know as a presenter and what the audience knows. And uh, because I know the stuff so well, it's easy for me to look at the slide in the moment and be like, okay, got it, next. Well, no, <laughs> that doesn't work, right? That kind of thinking doesn't work because it doesn't matter that I as a presenter get it. Of course I get it, I'm the one who created it, right? right. It takes me two seconds to remember what I'm looking at takes them two minutes. I think that's, an, that's another thing I've noticed a few times I've been to presentation that had a slide show is that the presenter has a tendency to either go way too slow on how fast they're going through the slides or way too fast to the point that I don't have time to assimilate them, understand them. Which one are you? I'm <laughs> too fast. Too I'm too so, fast. so guilty of that. <laughs> so, if, you know, if, if you're a little bit stressed out as a presenter, yeah, you might exactly. have the tendency to just get over with yeah. it, right? Like, let's just skip through it. But it, it, you have to give enough time for the audience to hear what you have to say, visually read what you have to say, put the two together, make their own opinion, and then move on to the next yeah. thought. It's a and lot that of stuff takes to a lot of time because it's the first time they're they're hearing about that content. Yep. Right. Yeah. No, it's a really good point. I um, I've get enough. I've given enough presentations in my life to where you would think, or I would have thought I'd be better at it by this point, but I'm not. In part because it's the typical thing whenever there's a presentation instead of just you know upgrading the presentation and fucking reinvent the thing and create and then not only do i reinvent it i'm like oh 
in this whole concept was wrong we gotta change the whole thing now <laughs> you stay up and then and then like one of the ones i gave well i was sick actually for that one but at another time i liked i didn't sleep at all at all and and like when you're in school and you do all nighters over and over again you get kind of used to it so you learn how to function it's like you know you're like, you're like a, a functioning drunk sort of right a functioning all-nighter person but when you're a little bit older and you don't do that as often and then you do an all-nighter you're like <laughs> completely completely fucked the next day and so i thought i'm going to counteract this by drinking a venti thing of coffee and oh, it was the no. worst <laughs> During the presentation, I didn't know if I was going to collapse, have a heart attack, or shit myself. And, um, but, but yeah, I was flying through stuff, man, because I was so jittery. Okay, look, rule number one do not reinvent yourself or your routine prior to a presentation. Well, okay, presentation is enough of an unknown. You do not know exactly how it's going to go. So control the thing that you can control beforehand. Yep. So don't start drinking venti coffees before it. Yeah, we're just avoid venti coffees. I mean, it's, venti coffees. I mean, it's, 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 it's stupid. <laughs> stupid is what it was. There's no other word for it. Um, but I think that's a very good point that when you when you are presenting, most people are nervous. Um, I I sure still get nervous a lot of the times. And when you're nervous, time speeds up to you or slows down or whatever. It feels like it feels like to you it's been two minutes when really it's been two seconds. Right? right and that's where you end up rushing through things because there's this aspect of present presentations presenting where everyone is afraid of silence and this is a big 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 issue this is something that everyone struggles with i for sure struggle with it on here on the podcast right and at the very beginning when we were doing the show i don't know for you but for me that was one of the things that made me the most nervous was when we were talking there's a, a dead space because no one oh, has you made me very nervous about it i'm not so nervous about silence because i don't mind being quiet but yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 so there's this need to fill the silence always and but it's and it's not like you're on the phone and it's silent and you don't know if the person's still there or not you're in the room person is just gonna be silent for a little while but eventually they're gonna go back to talking no no right? i know i know like it's I, fine i know it's it's fine and it's almost sort of irrational but it's this like when you're talking, you're you're in the middle of doing something, right? right? And you're less conscious about all the things that could make you nervous. And there's a sense of progress. I'm doing something. I'm saying something. We're going somewhere. And you stop talking and you for a moment forget where you are. Something kind of throws you off kilter. It's like, oh. I'm on stage. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> what am I you, doing here? <laughs> exactly. It takes you out of the flow. And, and the people, when they're presenting, are so afraid of, of getting out of that flow state because they are afraid that the audience is going to think that they don't know what they're doing yeah and the same thing here even when we're doing interviews it's not a presentation but when we're doing an interview and there's an awkward pause i i i light up with kind of fear because it's like oh shit, uh this is going to come across as awkward you know so let me fill the space with a very long um or a so no to that's try where i and... come in and i start saying something random <laughs> yeah. but no but i think uh, yeah i think you're right and i think it's i think you have to be okay in not being the perfect presenter and maybe having some doubt and maybe just you know even being honest with the audience and be like Oh, you know, I'm lost in my notes. Give me a, a minute. You know, if you're actually lost in your notes, so, that's so, fine. So I definitely want to talk about the honesty thing, but but back to the silence real quick. So I actually think injecting silence intentionally is really, really important. And just stare at people. Because if you consider this fact, and then you wait, <laughs> people, people pause and they listen. And the other thing, too, is that if you keep talking, even if you're the most exciting person, it's going to feel monotonous. Right, because right. there's these, they're all shades of gray and black. You need some white in there, right? Well, you need, watch you out need, what you're saying. <laughs> you need space. And so think about this too, like the times that I've been an audience member and someone's talking and I'm fairly interested in it. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is interesting. I'm not asleep. I'm not like hyper engaged, but it's pretty good. And they stop talking. I'm like, wait, what just happened here? I wake up, right? Because it's a break. So I think it's a really good idea to have silence and um, it's perfectly fine if you lose your place or if someone asks a question, you don't have an answer. You don't have to be like, 
Um, we say um because we're afraid of silence. But just taking a second and saying, I'm not sure about that, is totally fine. It's, it's actually more successful and productive than trying to fill that void. And that also reminds me, for slideshows, you don't have to talk about every slide, right? It's perfectly fine to put up a slide and let it be just this a beautiful thing that you've created, right? And let it soak in. <laughs> like what? I don't know what. A picture of a, I don't know, some kind of... A pig? Picture of a, a pig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something, right? That's okay, because maybe not every slide needs to be talked about. That's a good point. That's a good point. Or you could also have slides that kind of wake up your audience. You know, I mm. think like you were talking about the rhythm, you know, like right. rhythm, speed and colors within your presentation. Like I I feel like the most successful presentation are the ones that are very entertaining in a way, like they don't feel boring. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm having fun. I feel like ultimately the most successful one is like I felt like I learned and I had fun learning what I learned. Right. So having some slides that, you know, are funny or like super bright in color or have some crazy graphics, I think are totally fine. As long as it's not every slide, but just kind of like little, you know, flashes through your audience mm -hmm. to just wake up their attention once in a while, I think it's successful. I think it's good. I mean, <laughs> I was at a design review remotely and a kid was like throwing in memes. <laughs> and it was actually pretty good. I mean, like it lighted it lightened the mood and also it made it actually fit the topic he was trying to wrestle. But you know, it's in in some ways too the marker of a good presentation is that it's memorable right right and another marker of a good a successful presentation is if you get most of the questions afterwards if there's three presenters and you get all the questions that's a great thing it doesn't matter if they dis if they uh, disagree with you it doesn't matter the reason why they're asking questions if they're asking questions and they aren't asking anyone else questions you've beat the other presenters yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure uh, no, but you got them to react, which is the ultimate goal of a presentation. Yeah, you got them to think. Right. You know. Um, uh, the other thing with slideshows is that when, and this applies to, I guess, any form of presentation, it's a terrible idea to just tell us what we're looking at. And oh I think my this God. is. There's so much of that. <laughs> yeah. There's so much of that, especially in architecture, because it's mm. so easy to just have a rendering. Or a floor plan, yeah. and we're like, okay, you enter through the foyer, and then you get into the living room, and 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 here is the plan, and it's like, yeah, I can read that. I've right. I, like no, again, know your audience. Audience is architects. You right. don't have to say those things. We are able to read it. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah. So don't tell them what's there, especially if they already understand it. Tell them why they should give a fuck about it. Right. Or and, what is there that might not come out as being there? Yeah. You know. Uh, no, what does that mean? Well, instead of being descriptive about like, oh, this is the room, this is the door, this is the window, it's like, well, the sequence of evolution or the way you flow through this and that, like it's, right. it's, it is not what the drawing is is showing, but it is what the drawing is saying. Right, does it's the it's sense? the dimension that it's 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 the it's the, I get what you're saying, right? It's the vision the drawing is either trying to represent or it's the story behind the drawing right. or something else that we're not seeing. Right, and I think that's really. It's a common mistake for, for all presentation formats, and maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit more with slideshows because with slideshows, especially for lazy presenters, they'll do this thing where it's like, "Oh yeah, and here's here's the house that I did. Oh yeah, and here's the front of the house, and here's the back of the house. Uh, oh, this is the kitchen, and it becomes this form of storytelling that's just." And then this happened, and then that happened, and then I went to the store, and then I went home, and then I fell asleep, and then I woke up, and then I went to the store, and and then there's and no then. Story. But it's not. It's like it's, you're just telling us like, why are you even here? <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't need you, and your work's not that interesting either. So I don't see your work. You know, like like you can't do that. Um, so the and then and then and then is an easy thing to fall into. And actually, when I go to make slideshow presentations now, it's something. Usually, I'll, I'll write out a a, a script, a, mm -hmm. you know, a shorthand script. And I will almost always write at least the first thing I'm going to say about each slide, because I know Some for kind my of storyboard, your storyboard, right. yeah. Because I know that when I get to the next slide, if I didn't do that and I just winged it, the first thing I would say is something to the equivalent of "and then this happened," right? right? Which is utterly boring after the like eighth time. 
Well, and oftentimes you just end up talking about the results, but you're actually not talking about how you got there, mm -hmm. which is ultimately the most interesting part oftentimes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, slideshows, there's room to throw in fun anecdotes and slides that, like you said, are breaks, but even like whole chapters could be breaks, right? So mm -hmm. if you're talking about a project, it's great to see all the stuff about the project, but if you have photographs of people working on it, like um like we had this one project that we had done and uh, we showed obviously drawings and renderings stuff like that but also involved uh working with a bunch of people and traveling so we fucking threw that into the slideshow i mean the presentation was about concepts and stuff but we put that part in there because it's human it's interesting it gives more color and flavor and context to the thing that people are looking at because and this is getting off now but if we're talking about a design that's created by a person but created by me you're going to understand the design better if you understand me better, right? Um, uh, this is a little bit off topic, I suppose, but my younger sister is is a physical therapist, and she went to um, Columbia University for her degree of a PhD, actually. No, mm -hmm. doc doctor? Doctor? I don't PhD. know. What, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't know, even sound right if you know her. That's a lie. Oh, that's not a real PhD. She's You're giving doctor, a phone, <laughs> phony PhDs at the school. Um, uh, but anyway, she was giving me a presentation and I, and I came to the class just to watch just because it's for fun and also wanting to get out of work. And, uh, you know, it's like a medical biology, whatever course. And it's like really, for me at least, complicated, confusing, like in very detailed lateral, biceptoral vein, whatever things. But her first maybe about 90 seconds of the presentation was just pictures of her and her family. And <laughs> apparently I was in the slideshow. And of course that has nothing to do with the content, but it was so successful in terms of, cause it was a nine o'clock in the morning class, you know, grad students successful in getting everyone kind of more on the edge of their seats and excited and, and whatnot. And uh, again, totally irrelevant, had nothing to do with, she didn't create the present, didn't create the topic or the information. So there's much more distance between her and the subject, but still just like super effective, right? Had she not done that, I don't know if the audience would have been, but certainly they wouldn't, they would not have been as, as awake. I don't no, think. I think it's, I think it's good to throw different types of things in their presentation to, to give different tones to it. Yeah. You know, like you could have tones that are very serious tones that are more like like thinking like i don't know where you know kind of brainstorming together tones that are more personal mm -hmm. tones where you make people laugh you know it could be just one laugh during a presentation but you know what it never hurts anybody <laughs> knock, right? knock, like, joke. you know <laughs> a good, well just make sure it's funny before you say it because if you say it and it's not funny no. that might not help you for the rest of it i'll find it funny um <clears throat> the final slide so you have your presentation your slide wait yeah. so but you were talking about like how you did the storyboard to make your presentation. Mm -hmm. I think the process of making the slideshow is also interesting. In what way? Well, you can either like start like, you know, work one slide at a time, or you can just think about the main point and then what is the beginning, what is the end? How am I gonna start the journey with my audience? How am I gonna end it? What are all of the things I wanna cover? What order my slides are in, mm -hmm. right? Like. And so, like, the way I do it, I just kind of, like, start sprinkling things over my different sides. And then, you know, eventually you shuffle one one before, one after. Right. You start splitting one into two or three, maybe, because it makes more sense. Mm -hmm. But kind of having, like, a, a loose approach to it when you start building the slideshow yeah. instead of focusing on... You know, some people yeah. maybe sometimes just focus on getting the graphics right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting yeah, the yeah, setup totally of right. the page template right and then you yeah. can jump in. Don't focus with that yet. Yeah. You'll find out that at the end. Just start thinking about the skeleton of your slideshow. That's a really that's really good advice and we could probably do an episode just about creating presentations perhaps, but that's for sure... That's for sure it because a lot of people when they go to make a presentation they obviously have some kind of content and they start with that content fine but they limit themselves to that content and that's not really what you should be doing that's also why starting the pre starting the process of making the presentation sooner in a design project let's say is super helpful because you understand the gaps that you have to fill for the presentation for presentation purposes 
But more often than not, those gaps also align to things that you're missing in the design anyway. In the project, yeah. In the project. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but so what I was going to say is the for a slideshow, you have all your slides, you go through it, and, and the if if the the presentation is a fairly graphic one so you're presenting a design of something and you're going to get questions from people uh from a big audience and especially if you're going to get questions from a small audience aka a jury uh, review your final slide should be a overview of the big things that you covered because what happens always in a slideshow format jury review is when we get to the end, someone has a question about a slide that happened 30 slides ago, can't find it, the PDF takes too long to load, or whatever, and it's, again, super disorienting. And the issue is that you are, you only have so much time for Q&A, so much time for the presentation, right? You have a limited amount of time, a limited amount of learning you can get out of this process. The more time you have to spend fucking around, the less you're learning from the process and the less good the feedback is, right? So you have to have a final slide that basically acts as a board, a summary of everything, because again, as, and this gets to, to problems I have with the slideshow, as a viewer, I've seen the project through a keyhole this entire time, right? Little bits of information. And a lot of times at the end, like I, I'm left, like just wanting to see the whole thing, you know? And it's really hard to give good criticism and feedback and have a good Q and A. We don't have something that just says, "Boom, here it is," and now we can talk about it openly, right? If you only show everything through a keyhole, I don't know how you have conversation based on that. So you mean like I don't know, maybe having like an extended kind of t outline, like you know, not table of contents, but basically listing like all of the main ideas that have been discussed, or like some kind of contact sheet of all of your slides on one page so you can really see all the slides in once no not not all of your slides like so i mean it's tough to talk about it uh without specific examples but let's say a presentation is 50 slides long right right um you should probably have five big images on the last slide which will function as a board right and the most important ones the ones that you want to have be talked about the ones you think that the audience will want to talk mm. about that way we don't have to fly through things. Kind of the takeaway. The takeaways. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right. But, 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 you know, if uh, like one rendering, one floor plan, one, and if, uh, for a building, I would expect to see a floor plan, an elevation, probably a section, a couple perspectives. Well, that's probably about it really, mm. you know, but we need to see it all together. Um, both for the sake of just the Q and A functioning, but this gets back to the idea of the, the presentation as a form of education so that you can learn more. You can learn more. And this is why slideshows are really great to tell stories because they make it easy. You're, you're spoon feeding information to the audience, which means you have a lot of control over what you give them, which makes it easy for them to go down this very, very narrow path one step at a time with you. Right? Yeah. But it's also a very uh, filtered and restrictive form of presentation because of that. Yeah. I mean, you only allow them to see what you've decided to yep. show on yep. that side and you only allow them to look at it for a certain amount of time mm -hmm. and then again they might never see it again <laughs> yeah and that's why it causes confusion right yeah. because maybe you, you kind of have to do the presentation for the greatest common denominator in the audience right and there's gonna be a few outliers who get stuck on a slide and they get lost behind they get left behind for a few slides so but you need to kind of judge that but that's what i'm saying like having an overview is good because it, it allows everyone to understand where, what the fuck they've just gone through right you know right. well especially <clears throat> if it's a presentation of a project through a slideshow it seems like having some kind of yeah like big overview of everything like again you know you look at a building it's not like you're looking at the door handle for an hour like mm -hmm. you have to look at everything right to understand I it and that's where that's why I don't like it for for educational settings because it's too easy. Like I was saying before, it's one step at a time, so the narrative becomes really convincing. That also means it's very easy to create a convincing presentation that is actually of a dog shit project, right? right. Because it's very easy to hide. Right? I I only have to sell the audience one tenth of a of an idea at a time. That's easy to do, 
right? And by the fact that I've gone through, you know, 60, 70 slides, the, it's, the audience feels like they've gained a lot, but really the same thing with like social media. I've seen a lot of stuff, but there's not anything. But then you're tired at the end too. It doesn't so. add up to anything. No. And yeah, you feel mentally exhausted because you a lot of your brain power as an audience member is trying to remember like where you've been and where you're going and like how this ties to that. Especially when you're talking about a project, a thing, a topic, a subject that is all about how stuff uh, fits together. Like you said, well, you can't just show a doorknob and then a room and then a table and what like, okay, but how does it all fit together? This it's is disjointed. This is, of course, what a design project is. And so when you're showing only bit by bit by bit, it's a false narrative, yeah. right? The yeah. critique should be not of each bit. It should be of like the whole thing together. And slideshows and the way that people use them as a way to win and convince the audience don't work in an edu educational setting most of the time because the information that's being put out is limited and therefore the feedback is limited. It's almost like it would be even, it would be super interesting to actually have a giant board instead of a sideshow like you would have a printed board right mm -hmm. and you just click in one element and it takes you almost like inside of it right and you mm -hmm. can dig deeper and then zoom back out come back to the board and go back in into another thing they have that, that. They yeah have that they have that they have that they, they they've had uh, software like that for, for quite a while oh. it's an app thing you download oh, i feel so dumb saying that. but but I mean, they have it, but it's not used because it's a new thing you have to learn, and right. then you're floating in space and stuff. And uh, so, so anyway, I, I I do think though the positives of the slideshow are well, we already mentioned them, but also it's easier to talk about conceptual things uh, sometimes because you can spoon feed. So yeah, I found I found that a slideshow is really good to convey kind of the why behind something and maybe the how. But the final thing, if we want to see the final thing and be able to judge it from all angles, sideshow, not so great, right? Not so great. I mean, it's actually really frustrating as an audience member sometimes because it's like, okay, but what about the thing that we're meant to be talking about and, and interested in, right? What bothers me is I don't have the control of looking at what I want to be looking at. That's the other, that's, that's the gap, right? Between you, the presenter, and the audience, like they're either ahead of you or behind you. And and, you and the audience have to be in sync with the speed of the presenter. You know, yeah. the presenter has decided to spend a lot of time on that side, and there is nothing that's really, you know, <laughs> that interesting, right. or, or was, what's being said is not that captivating. Then it's kind of like, okay, I want to move on already, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? I'm a very impatient person. <laughs> I admit um, it. So I, I, that's all I have to say with slideshows. Um, they're interesting. They're much more common now, especially because of Zoom. Um, yeah. But but again, uh, I think there are some flaws with it from an educational standpoint, if you're trying to learn. Right, right. right. The other thing too is I think um, slideshow and probably presentation in general should have a clean intro like oftentimes you know the beginning is very awkward like you don't know as the presentation started uh, like is at the start what is it what project where are you from like what do you do like i don't right. know any background information mm -hmm. so i think a clean intro is always helpful putting some context to the subject that's going to be discussed the project yeah. that's going to be discussed and at the end too it's very awkward when you know okay that's <laughs> it and now what uh, is that it is that the last slide that we're doing questions what's happening so having something that wraps it up and also just having something that wraps up the thought and the presentation itself without just wrapping up the event of the presentation, mm -hmm. you know, like it's just, it just makes it feel like it's, 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 that's, that's it. Like you, you buckle the buckle, you know? Yeah, exactly. Again, it's, it, yeah. Creating context. Like if it was a physical book, I know I'm at the beginning and I, when I'm at the end, I know there's only one page left. And maybe people don't know who you are, and mm -hmm. maybe it, it's important for them to know who you are, where you're from, and what you've done, right? If it's a jury for your presentation, you know, if, if it's a specific project that is very dear to you for whatever reason, mm -hmm. I think, you know, that, that people have to know. <laughs> yeah, no, I think the idea that context is important is an important idea. Um, oh, fuck, what was I going to say? Context? 
I mean, context is important. It's like you don't start a project without looking at the context. Well, same thing. You don't start talking about it without talking about the context. You know, you go to the doctor for an exam, like they ask you some background or some context. Where are you from? How old are you? What's your weight? Do you have any problems? Right. Like you need to... You know, it's just normal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, there's two ideas from that. The the first is that I think it's to eliminate confusion because again, this is this goes back to so in architecture presentations, there's always a critic who's like, "Where's your north arrow? Right? Where's your labels that says plan and elevation?" And a lot of times, that criticism is kind of received as being uh, as coming from some kind of old fart. It's like, get over it, man. Like we're in the future now. Like stop talking about your north arrows, bitch. But we it's in VR, it's, man. Yeah, There's yeah. no north anymore. <laughs> exactly. But it's a really good point because you have to supply basic information or context or whatever there to work off of. Um, the worst thing that can happen is that a person starts talking. And if you don't let people kind of get situated and know like where we're going and where we're start what we're starting with, they're going to spend the first five minutes of let's say a fifteen minute presentation, a short presentation, first five minutes just trying to figure out what's going on. Right. Like I mean, think about at at reviews or, or any presentation. Like a lot of times you sit there and I'm like, okay. I have no fucking idea what, what's going on right now, though. You've said a bunch of stuff, and usually the important a part of the presentation is usually all very, very beginning. I haven't listened to any of it because I'm still trying to figure out, like, is this the building I'm looking at? Like, wh- what? what is this exactly? Are we in Mexico? We're we talking well, about Mexico? I Did mean, you say Mexico? Th- yeah, like your jury, could, your audience could be a jury, and they've gone through, like, three other reviews today, and they forgot what your class is about, like, what year you're in, what's your... Uh, you know, curriculum, like mm-hmm. they don't know, right? You Super had a, good cli- point. a client presentation. Well, the client has been to another one because they're doing multiple projects. They forgot who you are. They forgot what project they're here for. Like, yeah. you never know. You go to a lecture, people are signing for a lecture, just show up and even sometimes forget the name of the person who's lecturing mm-hmm. or didn't do any research about the, the person so they don't know their background. Yeah. So it just doesn't hurt to take a couple of minutes get everybody no on it's the a same really page. it's a really really good point and that could actually save the presentation and save you a lot of headache because um, the worst thing as a presenter is that you you talk about something and at the end someone has a question you're like didn't you fucking listen to what i said and maybe they weren't listening because they're being rude or it's because you started and you didn't give any kind of footwork you know you didn't yeah. give a ground beneath them and consequently they're trying to problem solve something they didn't want to be thinking about and so that's not good in terms of convincing the people, but it's also not good in terms of education again, because then you're getting fuck feedback, right? As uh, as a presenter, I don't want the jury to be trying to figure out where North is, right? I want them to be thinking about much more interesting things. So give them that basic dumb information at the beginning so that doesn't waste time. Yep. Again, it's being the TV, the TV presenter, right? Okay. Hi, this is Susan, and today we are Wednesday, September right, right, 25th, right. and I'm presenting the news. And I'm like, okay, I know what I'm looking at. You know, <laughs> I, I was watching Seinfeld. This is nuts. <laughs> no, you know. Um, yeah, and I think also this is a very minor note, but at the very beginning of the event and the presentation, people were moving around and stuff a lot of times. And if you have someone doing an introduction for you, that's different. But if you're rolling in kind of like on your own... It's very good to kind of just pause for a moment. Let everyone get settled. Let everyone figure oh, yeah. out, get their notes, you know, sorted out. Um, a lot of times people start talking and people aren't settled yet. I'm like, hey, what are you doing? Wait a second. Don't don't feel pressure to start because there's silence and because you're standing in front of people. Or because Wait. the clock is running. Wait on them. And, you know, if you have a certain amount of authority and they're fucking around, tell them like, okay, we'd like to get started. Take care of your shit so we can move on. Um and this this is maybe a side topic, but maybe a well well, this also reminds me that whatever context you're whatever the place that you're doing the presentation in, you have to understand really well, right, and change how you speak, how loud you speak, how you behave, et cetera, et cetera, with that room, right, and like for me, that's one of the things I always do is if I know the place I'm gonna do the presentation, I try to uh, like scope it out beforehand. 
you know, not like a day before. I mean, if I can do it a day before, it's a big thing, then fine. But otherwise, just even 10 minutes early to see like, okay, what's the room? What problems are going to have? Is there a glass wall I don't like? Uh, do I want people not sitting there? Or is this person too close, too far? How am I going to have to turn to face everyone? Um, all of those things I want to have sorted out because, you know, again, that, that can make or break a presentation. And if people come in, they start fucking around chairs, and I'll, I will control it. I'll be like, no, <laughs> don't sit there. You sit over there. And people laugh and think it's funny, but it's so hard once you start a presentation to then stop and be like, I'm sorry, do you mind moving or do you mind doing this? No, set everything up <laughs> exactly how I want it, and then we go. And that's totally fine. I think people should do that more often. Yeah, well, for sure. The next format of presentation it's is... a three-hour podcast. The boards. Yeah. The boards, people. Well, well, well. The boards is not a slight show. <laughs> it's true. Boards, printed boards. It could I be you could just like I, throw boards. <laughs> I like I like boards. I like boards a lot. Boards for, one, for, boards two. <laughs> for all the reasons uh, that I don't like slideshows, um, I think again from an educational standpoint, it, you're just able to get much better feedback because you're not hiding it's really hard to hide behind I, a set of boards i like the boards because yeah you put everything down on yeah. the table it's like it's you're standing naked in front of exactly. the audience right look at all the goodies and uh, but and therefore it's a lot more pressure mm -hmm. to do a good board than to do a good slide show yeah because it's for everyone to see and judge for whatever time you're going to be up and talking for the entire time the entire time and you could lose them they could be staring at the wrong thing you know like you don't have any control of that yes exactly they could be staring at the wrong thing the entire time um so the same way that the slideshow is basically your visual outline that you're using as you go through the presentation the board acts the same way the same way the portfolio acts like that when you're doing an interview the resume does that also during an interview they're all talking points it's your cheat sheet it's your cheat so, sheet Whatever element you put on the board, you're going to talk about. Whichever size is going to be on the board, it's going to mean more time to be talked about, maybe. Mm. Whichever order it's going to be on, on board one, board two, board three, you don't want to like start on board one, no. jump to board 10, go back. It's the same thing as Can't jumping between slides on the yeah. slideshow, right? There is this kind of path that you're taking people. It, it's almost like a map, almost a board, right? Yeah, it is. It is a map, and you're, you're, taking people through those different places at, you know, not chronologically, but in a rational way. Mm -hmm. And people really, it's really difficult for people to understand things and consume information if it's not fed in a linear fashion. Right. Right. That's probably why storytelling is such a heavily used terms in all aspects of life, because there's a linear progression. It's chronological. That's how we understand things. So that's where you're saying, if I go upper left and bottom right, then upper left, it's like, what is this kid doing? doing exactly i don't really they look confused and if they're not confused i'm now as confused as fuck well and um, they have to put the, the the pieces of the puzzle back together so mm -hmm. it's way more complicated for them again because they're not familiar with the project yeah and the board to assimilate them and and put them back together the strengths of it's it's actually if you could do both in a presentation i think that's the ideal thing because i've always felt that most presentations there are parts where you really want them looking through a keyhole. You know, when a circle starts really small and it's big, big, bigger than blows off the page, well, fuck, that's like graphically powerful. That means something conceptually. You can't do that on a board. You can't have a bunch of slides that go like this because it just looks like tiny thumbnails. You're like, okay, I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. not, not successful. Um, but the board does allow the audience to sit and see everything the entire duration, which means it allows them to be a little less confused possibly than the slideshow. Because they can kind of problem solve on their own, right. even if you're fucking up. Right. Or they could be like, oh, okay, like, I understood that idea. So that that's what's there over there. So they don't have to ask you the question. And you don't necessarily have to explain every single thing that's on the board. Mm -hmm. Because they could puzzle piece it together. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so boards, I think the presentation happens you know, in time. And so it happens linearly to a certain degree. So your boards have to reflect that. So it's it's easy for people to digest. I think the benefit though of boards is that you can have ideas that kind of coexist at the, ta at the same time and show that. And that's the frustration with slideshows. It, it, you, you feel like you're forced, I guess you could put multiple stuff on a slideshow, but you feel like you're more forced to kind of take it down like one step at a time. But there are aspects of 
thinking where it's like, no, that doesn't really work. It's more about these three things happening simultaneously, overlapped, you know, weaved or whatever the interaction is. And that's where having multiple boards can be like really, really helpful. And that's why I think boards are better at conveying things like architecture, uh, which are complicated because it's showing off the success of the project that is its ability to weave together a bunch of different things and have it all make sense. Physical things and conceptual things and well, whatever. And I think it's also the ability to communicate the project itself without anyone pre even presenting it. Yeah. On yeah. a slideshow, not, not necessarily. Yeah, I think that's true. So on the flip side, like you were saying, you're kind of, you're there and you're open, everyone's seeing your stuff. I, I think, and that's a very particular thing, but I think it's okay to put large paragraphs of text on boards. Oh, no. As long as it's legible from wherever well, people are sitting. Yeah, I mean, how because... many times have I seen on like, you know, in school or after school, like kids who put like pages of text and I'm like, it's so small. Nobody is gonna read it unless it's after the presentation. And also, I don't have the time to just stare at your board and read it and understand it, so. It, 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 you know, like print a pamphlet, put it for people to pick it up sure. if they're interested, but sure. don't put it on the board. It's taking room for something else that probably was more helpful. And oftentimes the text is either not interesting, <laughs> not well written. It's a straight copy from like Wikipedia or some stupid Google page about historic facts or whatever to yeah. kind of like fill a blank that was on the board. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it's just, uh, it, it's not helpful. I feel like anything that's on the board should be yours unless it's like analytical things or right. precedents that are directly related to the projects, right? There is yeah, no filler. Then. There is no like like random filler on the board. Right. Like everything should be deliberately decided and deserving to be on the board. Right. Uh, precedents. Yeah, I have a, I have a thing. Precedents. Uh, I mean, I don't. I don't think it should be on there. It's kind of. It's kind of weird to me. It's, I don't know. That's a different topic. But the reason why I say it's okay to have some. Te well, there's two thoughts. The first is I agree with the, with most of the, most of the things you've said. I've certainly experienced that, seen it. I've been a a, a person who's done that myself. <laughs> made all those mistakes. I made all the mistakes. Um, there is something about like showing stuff that's not legible but it's to show that it's part of the pro no no, 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 no. so you're shaking your head people you don't see you're shaking your head but uh, it's stuff that's not meant to be digested in that moment for example bringing books that you use to research from right and having those at the presentation obviously i'm a i'm a jury member or, or whatever i am i'm not going to read the book I don't know if you've read the book. I mean, I'm going to assume you've read the book, but it fits into the thing that you're selling, right? Versus the kid who didn't bring research books is like, okay, well, now I think that you've done more research on this person. That's what I feel. Or that's why I was saying like um, for portfolios, I'm okay with having a bunch of text because it shows that you have something to say. I'm okay to have a bunch of text in portfolios, for example. Right. I'm okay to have a good amount of text on the board as long as it's legible. You cannot show things sure, that... Legible. that yeah that are not legible, a drawing that's not legible, a text that nobody can read, because that is useless. It is mm -hmm. not an information that could be that could be read, you know. So the, but this gets to the idea of showing things that are not super relevant to the presentation. And, and I'm okay with it, but it needs to be done in the right way. It's different. If you're if you have boards and you're trying to sell something, and you're trying to win the audience, then don't put any of that fucking shit up there. You only put the things you need to win, right? But if you're trying to learn, it's okay to again kind of show, show you show all the naked parts oh, that you don't yeah. want to show. I mean, if it's you know like a, a desk script, then you no, not a desk script, like even a mid review, right? Yeah, sure, a mid review. Right. Yeah, maybe. See, I I think there's this I desire to have presentations be like the super polished, perfect thing, and therefore. We're going to enforce everyone follow this exact format or i feel like i have to exclude all this stuff and again to win fine but if you're trying to learn that's not what you would do right yeah honestly and, that's not and what you to would do win, to win you could have that stuff it doesn't need to be on the board like you said you could just have like you and know your like sketchbooks and study models right. and all of your trace with all of your diagrams like yeah. you can have all of that material because you have it yeah you can bring it because it could help supplement your your presentation 
Absol- but but if it's to win, whatever is on the presentation has to be a winning part of your argument. Sure, right? sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. But but uh, the process things that you mentioned, I mean, it's something we hear over and over and over in architecture uh, presentations and reviews is the process stuff because it's context. It helps the audience know where you came from. And therefore, if I'm trying to give you feedback or... If I'm a teacher trying to give feedback, that's one row. Or even if I'm a student watching Neil Denari give a presentation, when he shows context, where he came from, how this came from a certain place, that's really helpful for me because now I can better understand like the trajectory that was created to end up at this remarkable piece of architecture, right? When you don't have that story behind it, it's just less powerful. I think it, you're right, and I think it shows the the work you went through, the the process that you had, mm-hmm. and it might help people understand how you got where you got. They might not yep. agree with where you got, but they're going to see your progression and the different things you explored and tried to get there. And sometimes, again, like I was saying before in the search show, it is the most interesting part. It's the process, mm-hmm. not so much the result, right? Right. If it's a client presentation, well, it's different. You want to sell them on the design, but you know what? Showing them some process models, they might be appreciative of like seeing all of the iteration and all of the hard work you've been doing. Yeah, client presentations are interesting because they're a mix. Like ideally what you would do as a designer is educate the client so that when they enter the next meeting, they have a better understanding of what good design is or what the process is. And that allows you to both make progress much more quickly. Um, but the client presentations are interesting because they are a perfect hybrid of education and also winning because you want to educate them, but you don't want to open that door too much to where now we're going down some random right. rabbit hole that you do to you were like, no, that would never even be <clears throat> a thought of mine to go this direction, but because they don't know anything about design, right? We're going to now have to do an option on that. So it's just weird, a amorphic, polymorphic, whatever, uh, understanding of a presentation where it's kind of a little bit of both in that sense. But having text on the board, what I was going to say, the other point is that, um, especially if it's your opening paragraph, like your thesis state statement, like the, the, the sentence, but also a paragraph beneath it, beneath it talking about, you know, whatever that people can read is legible in size is helpful because a lot of times, especially if the topic is fairly heavy and thick, the person that starts presenting like I said before, they start talking before everyone's settled. I just haven't gotten my water bottle or whatever. And uh, the first few minutes are just, they're not, no one's listening. Right? right, right. And even if they were listening, it's pretty heavy stuff. And to hear it once by a person who might not be eloquent and might not take their time, it's too quick. Yeah. Right? So having that text, to be able to go back, go and look at the text and reread it numerous times, so helpful. Right, right. So helpful. And again, this is all fuel to get to learn more, for everyone to learn more, right? And that's how I think that's how I view boards. Yeah, no, I think I think that that makes sense. Um, the other thing I feel like, you know, not talking about layout, but talking more about like content on the board and what and the meaning of the board, right? The meaning R- of the board, yeah. R- redundancy. Yeah. You know, redundancy might be okay if you're at a mid-review and you're still trying to figure out, like, well, if you're at a mid-review, it's kind of late, but, like, what kind of document, what ideas needs to be present on the board and stuff like that. But you cannot be redundant. You cannot just be showing one idea, have, like, 15 different documents, but they're all saying the same thing, Mm -hmm. right? So I think redundancy is a big one, and oftentimes, oftentimes students just, you know, even, like, jump on working on some of those... um, documents that would fit on the board like text or diagrams or plans or renderings without Mm -hmm. questioning what is the image showing what is the meaning what is the point of that document Mm -hmm. and that's where you end up with having redundancy because you've just jump in without you know questioning what you were doing right is this going back sort of to the idea maybe of starting the presentation making process sooner yeah, for sure. It's like working on your, your your slides, your order, what's going on the slides, like how is that being communicated? Like for sure, mm. for sure. You don't just like, you know, start a checklist of what should be on my board. I should have a side plan and this and this and that. Yeah. Start doing uh, it. 
and not wondering why you need it. Yeah. Like you might not need any of that stuff. It depends what is your story, what is your outline, where right. is your beginning and your end, and right? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. It's if you're shutting off that part of the brain where you're questioning whether or not something should be included and how it should be included, I don't think you can call yourself a designer. <laughs> I mean, that sounds kind of harsh, but that's the that's the fucking truth, probably. Right? You can't do that. You can't just assume this is what I need. It doesn't work that way, right. right? And these assumptions come from existing, you know, organizational structures that are forced on us. But when you are dealing with a client, let's say, there's no rules with a client. You make your right? own. There, there, there are some established things that we use, tools and drawings we use more often because they exist for a reason. They work. Like a floor plan does communicate certain things, and right. so it's a tool. But you, you should still question whether or not you need a floor plan at all. Um, and what value it brings. But just to assume that you have to have it or it has to be of whatever kind and you have to have it be lined with this or that is total nonsense. Total nonsense. Yeah. Says who, yeah. right? They don't care. Um, all right. The other thing that's interesting, I feel, is that maybe more with board format presentations, there's a, a bigger gap between the stuff that's behind you, right, and the things that you're saying. Um, in other words, typically in a slideshow, I mean, I said previously that you don't have to talk through every slide, and that's true, but you, you usually talk through most of the slides. So, like, what you're saying and the presentation, the graphic presentation, are kind of hand-in-hand hand the entire way. A board is much more flexible in that you can show a whole bunch of stuff, but only talk about half of it. And this gets to... Um, like the distance again between the inf the actual information of the project, i.e. the boards, versus the verbal part of the presentation. They are, they're not the same. They can't be the same. Impossible. I mean, unless you were to give a presentation that's like 50 hours, right? Most presentations, half an hour, hour, 10 minutes, something along those lines. And there's a tendency, I think, for people to feel like they have to fill, they have to say everything, right? Everything I've thought of about the project, because it's interesting to me, and it's all the intricacies of how things interact and whatever, I need to say it all. That's not true. Don't try and do that. It's a bad idea. I wish someone had told me that <laughs> earlier on in my career and reminded me to this day. But it's a bad idea. Um, one, because it goes back to the notion that the audience needs time to kind of absorb, think, reflect, right? To digest. But also, it's just, it's unnecessary. And if you feel like you have a lot of stuff to say and you cannot cover it in 10 minutes, don't cram it in the 10 minutes. Cover the big stuff, right? Use the Q&A portion, hopefully there is one, of the session to cover the stuff you didn't want to. So either you kind of design things such that the audience will ask. Mm -hmm. Like you, you cover, like there's like, you know, six kind of areas on your boards. You cover five and there's this one you didn't cover. Someone's going to ask about that six. Right, right, Bonus right. time for you, extended presentation. Even better now because it doesn't have to be formal. I can have a Q&A conversation with the audience. And if the audience doesn't bring it up, just fucking bring it up on your own during Q&A. That's one of the... the that's, that's how when we do these interviews, we know a person who's done interviews uh, and is, is experienced in it versus not. Because people who, who haven't done a lot of interviews, they think they have to answer the question you ask them. The exact question, in fact. So you ask them a question, and they'd be like, well, actually, this word I'd kind of tweak and change. and uh, But even then, I don't know the answer. And they, there's a pause. It's like, well, look, I don't really care. You just need to say something, you know what I mean? So as, as a presenter, if someone asks you a question, you should try and answer the question. But also, it's a great opportunity to pivot off to something else that you want to say. And I think right, we covered right, this right. point in the for interviews the same thing some of our guests do that often <laughs> they pivot. and i'm like all right okay we'll i love it on. i always laugh inside because i'm like yeah you know what you're doing you know what's up you know what's up and you saved me from looking like an idiot too right asking a question with with dead dead air um but so the q a you know if if presentations 10 minutes q a is 20 or half an hour just offload some of that stuff to the q a um, yeah for sure the, the the good thing that I like about uh, boards too is that it's it's um, it's very human to human. Yeah. Right. You have things pinned up on the wall, and you use your hand and you point at this, this, and that. You're like, you know, on the Weather Channel now. You're not. Yeah. You move from the news to the Weather Channel, <laughs> right? And it it just makes it more engaging. Like yeah. you're standing in front of the board, 
make sure you don't stand in front of the thing you're talking about because that happens too often. You're like, well, you're blocking it. How am I supposed to look at it? Like, <laughs> yeah. It's stupid. So, you know, make sure I, that, I, that well, doesn't... <laughs> that's why that's going back to the setup thing, right? Fucking don't put the chairs somewhere where you don't want them. Put them on the one side of the room. I know uh, where, where, what side to stand on from the board, you know, like, or, it, or be dynamic. Like, I don't know, move funny. Like, do, you know, entertain them a little bit. But also, there is the board on the wall. And then, like, there is, like, all the props, per se, of your right. process that you could have laid out on the floor or in front of you on the wall even and the board itself doesn't need to be a two-dimensional thing oh god yes okay what is it what? sounds complicated what do you mean a two but what does that mean i don't know it doesn't need to be flat what is it gonna be it could be three-dimensional like a relief some kind of folded origami thing no, I mean, the uh, elements hybrid. on the board don't have to just be printed. Oh. They could be hand-drawn. They could be glued to the board. They could, like, you can make the board whatever you want it to be, right? Getting deep here. Yeah, getting deep here. And then there is a relationship between what's on the wall behind you uh -huh. and what's in front of you, such as maybe your physical model of the project. Right. I feel like oftentimes students and even offices spend a lot of time money and effort making those physical models for the final presentation of the project yeah. and actually completely Forget. forgot about them and don't use them and you know if you're limited in how much space you have on the wall and how much space I mean, how much stuff you can fit on the board the 3d model the physical model can show things that you don't have to, again, redundancy, have on the model and on the wall. Yeah, good point. Right? So that yeah. leaves you more space to put more stuff on the wall and yeah. just use that as a tool. Pass things around in the audience. Keep them entertained and excited and, and you know, like show off a little. Like, yeah. be the showman. You got to be a showman. No, I think that's a really good point. And I think this maybe moves to speaking and presentations in like general. Transition. Yeah. Um, ah, do you have Zoom on here? Do you want to talk about? There's nothing really to say about Zoom. No, just the typical. No, let's just let's forget know. Zoom. Okay, we don't like Zoom. Zoom. No more Zoom. Um, yeah, you have to be enthusiastic and interesting. I I think one of the well, there's kind of two principles of thought with with presentation giving. I feel I think one is that you should be as polished as possible. No ums, no likes. No Make dirty, greasy hair. Take a good bath the night before. <laughs> Make sure you're making eye connection with everyone, different people in the audience. You're moving around and, you know, hands should be just straight down by your side. Don't do anything weird with it. And some of that makes sense. If you're a, a person who says the word like every other word and an audience member starts picking up on that, uh, presentation is ruined. However... <laughs> And I think we should all strive to speak more like that in presentation settings. However, that's really, really difficult to do. It takes probably decades for any normal person to get to that point, if ever. More important is that you're just authentic and honest with who you are, to a certain degree, right? And convinced by the things you have to say. And convinced and, yeah, well, sure, right. Authentically convinced. If you're not interested in what you're saying, if you're well, if if it's like a like a process presentation, like you don't have to be convinced because you're still trying to figure things out, right? But when right. you're presenting things to people, unless you're clearly stating that you're questioning those things or you're unsure, mm -hmm. like you shouldn't be like hesitating or be shy right, right, about right, what right, you have right. to present, because there is nothing more frustrating than feeling the awkwardness of the person presenting. You know how awkward and uncomfortable they feel about their idea and now not in sync they are with their idea yeah because at that point it's like you know what it's like you took the egg out of the water a little too early like <laughs> you're not cooked yet right you know okay. like your shit isn't figured out <laughs> like don't waste my time uh yes i get what you're saying and and that's where um Okay, so wait, wait, firstly wrap up the first thought, uh, which is that I think people that are really polished make good speakers, but they can also feel just utterly boring and oh, humanless, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And I do think that all of us are drawn to people who are true to themselves, yeah. right? Even if they're not really well-spoken, if they're honest in what they're doing, you kind of like it, right? There are limits to that, and I always push the limits to that, but uh, in terms of not being a good presenter. But... Um, I think that's that's the most important thing. Um, but to your point, what was the thing you said? The last thing you said? Not being cooked. 
not being cooked. Oh, confidence. Yeah. The other, the another big uh, uh, kind of idea with presentations is that the audience will feel whatever you're, whatever you are feeling or the feeling you're giving off. It is a weird thing. It is a weird thing. I mean, you know, it's like a stand-up comedian, right? If you can feel the stress of the comedian on stage, not good. That's not good. Like the performance, the the curtain is off, the light are on. Like Mm -hmm. you kill. Like the magic is not going to happen ever. Yeah. Yeah. It's sad. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i know what you mean and and that's where you need to be kind of like you said you, you're a performer you need to express the highs and the lows of the process like we went here we did this we lost the, we lost this item we found the item and then the bob had a heart attack or whatever you know <laughs> like you need to make it exciting and even though you didn't like bob and he's already been dead you don't care anymore you need to relive the moment the magic with them um, it's a funny thing how that works. It, it's weird because as soon as the audience can read your the emotion that they should not be reading, they're only going to be focusing on that. Yep, totally. And that's just that's just not good for you. And then if you even pay attention to the audience and you notice that they notice, then that's like that's 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 just worse. That's just not good at all. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you have to hide your emotion or you have to pretend to feel a certain way. I mean, if that could help you, sure. Mm-hmm. But it's more just, you know, just admitting that you're not perfect. You're not the perfect presenter. If you do great, that's awesome. But don't put too much pressure on yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like a lot of distress and I'm not one to talk. Like I hate doing like public speaking. That's not my thing, mm-hmm. even though I'm doing a podcast, which is kind of silly. But, you know, I feel just like admitting that well, I'm not. I'm not perfect. I'm not, you know, the best of this. But you know, I'm just going to give it a shot, and that's that's basically what it comes down to. Is just give it your best shot, and and it will be fine. Well, yes. I mean, I, I see what you're saying. I think you can only do. Are you saying that's the attitude you you should have to prevent stress, or are you saying yes. that you can actually say that out loud? No, don't say that out loud. Okay, okay. You say it to clear. yourself okay. before you jump on stage. Okay, right. 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 I, I do think, though, that uh, the idea of saying it out loud is kind of interesting. I don't ideally. I, so we all know the ideal presentation. You roll in, you look good, you're suave, you're clean. You know cut. how much time you have left. Exactly. And you know what slide is Throwing where. out the ideas and no one knows if like, did Throwing you just make this up on the, the spot? <laughs> and, you know, flags and confettis at the end. Ripping like, books yeah. and stuff. And people are like, hey, I need my book. <laughs> Paper's the future. Listen, so... um. We all know that scenario, um, but I do think, again, a lot of us just aren't there and maybe not, we'll never get there. I do think revealing the curtain a little bit can be helpful. So if you get stuck, first, don't panic, just pause and wait and try to re- recompose yourself. If you can't, it's not the worst thing to be like, just give me a second to go through my notes. It's not great, not really a good look. It depends on the context also, right? But in general, I don't think... Like, again, it's it's the difference between trying to... I think it's the difference between trying to learn and also trying to have a conversation on one hand versus trying to win and just sell, right? There's a lot of pressure if you're just trying to sell, right? But if it's more... If you're trying to have a conversation, well, there's an awkward pause. Who gives a fuck? Right, we got another ten minutes to go through. Let's move on to the next point, or, or I don't know, whatever it might be. And I think there's something that worked with that. When, I mean, the, the, you know, if you're not a, a great presenter, or you're not really used to. Well, the other helpful thing is watch other people present, right? And be critical about it. Take notes, like watch things I don't know on YouTube or or go to other reviews before yours happen. Take notes, like the things that you've noticed that people are doing, that the things that you know you're probably doing. You know, mm-hmm. or even record at home. Oh, that's so brutal. You know, present the board at home, record it, and then watch it. Yeah, I had to do that once. It was not fun. I would never do that. <laughs> okay. But take my advice. <laughs> I mean, I guess I do it in a way because we look at the things on here, but oh, I mean, an actual look, presentation. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 better. It's you painful. Know. You know? Um, the other thing that I wrote down on my notes in presentations or just everyday conversation, but especially in a presentation setting, there are, a, there are a number of what I would describe as meaningless, cheap modifiers, adge- adjectives. Like what? So they are the word just, like people people will say, I just try to do this, right? It's a way to kind of I say- I said just in every one of my emails. I, <laughs> I didn't do it. 
I just sort of did it. Right. right? It's right, an excuse. Right. It's allowing me to get out of any criticism. You might critique me, but then I'm going to be You're like, oh, wait, no. Yourself. I didn't say I did it. I said I just sort of did it. Right. And it's, it's in terms of like ideal presentation, like, don't do that. It's not necessary. Or I tried to. Don't say you. One of the best advices I, advices, a piece of advice I ever got was uh, a, uh, I think a second year teacher. He's like, stop saying I tried to. Just say you did it. Of course. Don't be apologetic. Of course. I mean, again, this goes back to honesty. If there's a part in the presentation that you're not sure of, I think it's totally fine to be like, I did this, to be honest, not so sold on it, but this is what I was trying to do. That's different from always saying, I just try to do this. I just try to do that. I, and, you know, when a student or any presenter says that, I'm like, fuck sake, what are you, five? Like, this is not a apology time. You're supposed to be telling me something to a certain degree. The others are... <laughs> The word actually, I hate the word actually. People right. use, this is the other, this is the the flip side. They use the word actually to build themselves up, right? right? right, right. I didn't go to the store and bought, I didn't buy Tabasco. Uh, Tabasco at the store. I actually went to the store and bought Tabasco. What do you mean you fucking actually went to this? No, you just went to the store. Right. I actually thought of a concept. Okay, you're trying to make it sound bigger than it is. You just thought of a concept. And right. most of the time when people use the word actually, it means the opposite, it means that they actually didn't do that thing at all, right? It's a fucking lie <laughs> that they're trying to sell. And if, if, listen, if you listen, people do it all the time. I do it sometimes for effect and sometimes subconsciously, but it's something that, that I, it's just, it irks me. No, right? I, 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 I can actually try to like, you know, question things. Or like, yeah, or like they, they reverse their, flip their coat, you know, it's like... <laughs> what does that mean? Well, it's, I don't know, it's a French expression. Like, oh. uh, um, what is it in, how do you say it in French? Oh, what is it in French? Um, I don't, I don't remember what it is in French. Oh, <laughs> I got the concept, but I yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, basically, like, you change your mind. Like, you get criticism about your idea from a jury, and you're like, well, actually, no, I was trying to do but there's that. There's that actually, too. Right? Yeah, there's that like, one. Like, oh, no, misunderstanding, that's not what I meant. I'm reading that you want to hear this from me, so I'm going to change my mind and mm -hmm. tell you that's actually what I was trying to do. Right. And it's like, no, it's complete bullshit. Don't try to, <laughs> don't try to well, make a case for yourself. You know? Well, I mean, sometimes that happens, but I think the, this goes back to maybe more of a Q&A kind of topic, but you always need to acknowledge the position that the other person is coming from and right. live in it for a second or repeat it back to them before you say your thing. You know, even if they're asking a really dumb question, you, you kind of need to do it. Otherwise, it goes again, it goes back to the idea you don't want to be a dick. And weird, pre giving a presentation is not just a matter of being right. It's about convincing people that you're right. And not, then therefore, it means with a large audience, you have to convince a bunch of dumb people <laughs> that your idea is right. And it means you have to understand it from their position and be nice to them, which is difficult. For why some people. I prefer to do a podcast. So it's not, um, wait, wait. So the other thing I wanted to say about speaking is that the other thing that I think is very helpful is don't try to just wing it the day of or thinking that you have all the elements on your board and yeah, you could just like navigate that way. I would actually write it down, like just <laughs> actually write it down. <laughs> Yeah, right. I would no, write but it, it, that's, would, a, that's would, an appropriate use of the word actually because most people don't write it down. I would actually write it down in words and sentences completely yeah. of all of the things you want to say about what is on your board, what is on your mind, and what you want to share with your audience. Put words with it, make like good sentences, use like adjectives and good words and, and no repetitions. So you have the plot right there that like you don't have to memorize it by heart and you shouldn't because there is nothing worse than hearing a presentation that was memorized by somebody like that yeah. is not I, I don't need you to be there. Right. I don't need to be there, right. you know. And so. when you do that, it, I think it actually, uh, <laughs> you see, <laughs> now, that's it, it's Frank code all over me, right? <laughs> Now that you've written it down, you can kind of break it into parts, and that is actually that could also. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I go, go finish your thought, Richard. That could, it could also be good to write that um, not not too early because you kind of need to know what your board looks like to write it. Sure. But to help you maybe put some titles or like give you yeah. orders or give you breaks yeah. or put space between elements because. It would yeah. shape your thoughts. It would yeah. shape your board. The presentation making process 
Maybe we should do. We should maybe do yeah, a, yeah, yeah. A, a thing about actually, like about actually right, <laughs> making a presentation. It's a very dynamic um, process uh, for sure because it's complicated. But what I wanted to say is that when you write your whole presentation, it's gonna give the color of what your speech is gonna sound like and the things you're gonna be talking about and your talking points and all mm -hmm. of that. But I would also try and put some special keywords in it not just keyword as like concepts and ideas you have to mention mm -hmm. but adjectives vocabulary words that just paint a clearer richer picture mm -hmm. because when from the perspective of the audience right uh you know and like we were saying not being descriptive when you do presentation of what is on the wall or what is on the screen as yeah. like this is the door and this is the window but being descriptive <laughs> this by, is the window by oh, the thanks. meaning of it <laughs> yeah. you know and just helping paint the picture in people's head right like you use i don't know superlatives adjectives like things that just like create emotion and 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 speak to people yeah. is a good way to captivate them without using technical words or go on forever but things. I know? think one of the most frustrating truths that I've heard and I I think I believe in um, is that people make decisions based on emotion and not logic. So in terms of... Of course, that's how you a, buy stuff. Being a salesman, which is some, again, parallels to giving right. a presentation, um, you have to create emotion that they vibe with. Yeah. And as a person who's you know, not really that kind of human being, I hate it because it's like or you could just listen to the fucking facts and use your brain. Yeah, your but I'm child. not going to buy that pair of jeans because it's supposed to be, you know, that length and resisting wind and well, whatever. Like, I might, but I'm also looking for something that I love and that vibes with me. Yeah, no, know? I mean, that gets into aesthetics and visual aesthetics. I mean, I get that, but it should, but anyway, um, there's a few other modifiers that I hear a lot, especially in our profession, which, again, cop outs. The, the first is that um, when a person goes to explain something, they say, I just started playing around, and then this is a result of that. Or I was playing around and this happened. And to me, it's like, again, I don't, are you a toddler? I don't, that's not, that's not an adult process. That's not a repeatable process. That's not really, I get that inspiration kind of comes randomly sometimes, but it's just a way overused phrase. I played around and this happened. It's like, but that's not, that's not actually telling me anything. Right, yeah, I soup dumplings. This happened. Okay, well, th 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 what? <laughs> the other one, a big one, which academics use, and a lot of leaders that are industry. I'm interested in right. I'm interested in this, and therefore, then I talk about the thing that I did. But the phrase "I'm interested in" completely reject it. It it's telling the audience, okay, you're not allowed to question why I did this thing at all because I'm interested in it. That's why. And it's such a cop out. It's like just because you're interested in doing like some very uh, you know esoteric whatever formal study, what? So now we can't question why it's a value at all just about because you're interested in it, right? Well, if that... you if you listen, so many people, students, not actually students don't do as much as established professionals. A lot of big players they say that, and it's like. But that's not an that's that's not an that's not an appropriate introduction or, or, or a way of giving context. Well, but that also probably tells you on how to approach the design problem. The limited view. I'm interested in this. That's what I'm going to do. All right. Well, what are you, the master of of the universe? Like, why do I care what you're interested in? You know what I mean? This is my window, and you, this is my project, and I am interested exactly, in this because exactly. this is all about me. Exactly. So make sure you don't make it about you. That's you know what, no wrong no thing. Or and don't say my window, my floor plan. No, it is not yours. Just <laughs> give it up already. Um, you had mentioned something about the the dangers of repetition or the negatives of it, but I think there are also positives to it. Um, this goes back well, to. Well, it depends. I mean, you can have redundancy, meaning the idea shows in, in multiple places or multiple documents, but in different ways. Mm -hmm. Right, and that might just complement itself to to be expressed, and that's fine. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's totally true. I was thinking more that, again, it's this game of you putting out information, and the audience has to hear it, register, absorb, digest, and form an opinion. And sometimes, if a if a presentation is pretty thick, you know, you have to repeat things over and over again for them to 
remember what's been talked uh, uh, been been covered. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so that's and, a way. And, yeah, and I would say that really depends on what is it you have to say. Sure. Like if your idea is like easily understandable, well, I don't repeat it because then you're just assuming people are dumb in the audience. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's right. definitely definitely true. You need to understand the scope of the audience, um, but that was well, so a repetition is a great way to emphasize something. Right. Emphasize yeah. something by making it different. Pink slide, loud silence, right? Silence followed by a word, or repeating it over and over again. Um, but understand the audience. It reminded me that's the other thing I like to do if it's possible. Uh, if I'm facing an un if I, actually we, this happened recently, where you know you get invited to do something, first question: Who's the audience? How old are they? What professions are they in? Are they from different time zones? Why are they attending this thing? How long has this this conference whatever been around? So I have an idea of that. Is it reputable? Right. All the stuff. The more I can know about the audience, the better I can curate to them and have a successful conversation with them. I mean, it's it's hard to do in a big kind of lecture hall, but if I can do it and I feel comfortable, I'd love to do it. How many of your students? How many are this? How many of that? And then, of course, those polls don't always quite work because, like, third percent of people only like raise a finger. You know. But that seems you bring an interesting thing, um, an interesting point, which is, you know, whenever you have to, you can ask questions to the audience during the presentation again to make it, you know, a little more dynamic, right? But during the Q and A, you could also have a list of questions you would want the audience to give you an answer on. Mm -hmm. If you're there to learn uh, about what you're presenting, you know, you could be like, well, how many of you guys didn't understand this? Or like, yeah. what do you all think about that idea? Or, you know, do you have any, I don't know, other example you could think of? Or, you know, like... That's pretty like, bold. Yeah. It's bold, but I think, you know, it goes both ways. They came to get something out of the presentation and you came to give it to them. But you probably also want some feedbacks and, yeah. and take some stuff back with you after that presentation. You're not just there to to give it out. You're also there to receive, right, in a way. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's a really good point. Especially if, you know, you had a final presentation and the jury didn't have any questions for you or had, like, stupid ones, like, you know, very, I don't know, pragmatic, like, where is your perspective, like, you know, stuff like that. Or like, oh, you don't comply with code, you know, like whatever criticism. And you feel like you're not satisfied with the questions that you got. Like, well, just have an agenda of questions you do on response. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it, it goes back to the attitude of, uh, I think a lot of presenters feel like they don't have the authority to do things. You know, like move chairs around, ask questions, fucking whatever. But it's like you do. You're, you're actually it, the one in control. You're the only person in the room who can do whatever they want. So make it how you want it to be. It's your performance. Right. Right. You could do, like you said, why well, there is, you know, like people have to sit on chairs. They can't, you know, sit on tables. Like there is some standards, but you can make it whatever you want. And maybe questioning what a presentation should be is the first question you should ask yourself, right? Like, does it need to be on the wall? Could it be in the ceiling? Could it be like what you know? Is it projected? Is <laughs> Look it a under your seats, audience. You all get a model. <laughs> Do I give them printout? Do right. they need to have some documents in their hands to understand my presentation? Like, I think thinking about it as like a like a TV entertainment show or like an artistic performance is is more interesting than just like being here doing your time and leaving and that's all you're there for i think that's true i think that there's a balancing act though between you don't want to like overdress the presentation like the present for me the presentation sure. is only a means it's a vehicle right and and i think the danger that i have seen is that sometimes the content and the presentation get mixed up and there are times where they should be mixed, but most of the time, though, the presentation is just a vehicle to convey the thing that we're talking about. And um, so what are some examples? Well, you have a person who's trying to be too creative with the presentation, and a lot of times it's to hide a shitty project, and it's like, all right, well, I'm just going to call you out because right. there's a bunch of no, bullshit sure. you've just done. Sure. You make us like do all these theat theatrics, right. right? But you got nothing, kid, so... Really, you wasted everyone's time, and now let's shit on you because you clearly need to be kind of beaten around a little bit. Um, sounds really that's the okay. That sounded a little bit harsh, but it's take my but, belt. But you know, it's um, 
you know, no, it's, th- it's that's not, a necessary it's not part excuse, of the process. It's not you, an you, excuse yeah. to not have a good content. For yeah, sure. and you can't let people get by because of that. Most of, of the presentations I've been a part of, you know, people in the audience are pretty good at keeping other the presenter in check. Other times, though, they lean into it, and it's just it's disturbing. Like I had, I've seen one presentation where this person was out there talking about a project, and it was like the worst presentation ever. I think they were reading something, and it wasn't well written. It was all over the place. Don't do reading. And they either. were like timid and underspoken, and then they stopped, and everyone praised it. They're like, wow. And they didn't do it intentional. They did it because they were this person just didn't know, didn't know how to give a presentation inexperienced. But the comments that critics had were like, "This is an interesting way to give a presentation." Actually, conceptually, it works with their project because of whatever, whatever. And I'm in the back going, "Hey, no, 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 no! You're meant to be helping this person. They have a lot of issues they need to resolve in the presentation. Don't don't tell them they did a good job. What are you? What's, what's wrong with you? No, what's wrong with you're you? You're not helping them." Yeah, if they were a professional 40 years old and they were in an art gallery doing this, bravo, very, very interesting. <laughs> but that's not the case, right? This is a younger person, they needed help, and you're doing them a disservice by leaning into something that you think is interesting, but ain't about you, and ain't about that 40-year-old artist in the art gallery, oh, it's that about you pro- this individual. Yeah, you project to be interesting. Exactly. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree that, you know, don't start thinking about making the presentation a performance if you haven't even thought about what is the thing to present. Like, yeah. it's a it's a balancing act on how much effort in, is put into all the parts. You know, it. the biggest part is the presentation itself, the content. So most effort needs to be put in that. Yeah. And then some efforts could be put in the rest, but it's a matter of, you know, ratio and proportion. Yeah. And priorities. It's almost like you can think of the presentation as like, you know, you're making this bridge or this pipe. That sounds kind of weird. This pipe that connects your you to the to someone in the audience. And your job is, I know it sounds kind of, now I'm envisioning like a, like a pipe that fits telephone. over to your, your head and my head. But, but you need something that's open and clear and you don't want any, you... You need to create a presentation from nothing, but the thing you create needs to basically also be a way to, you know, get through the forest of confusion and make a very clear. Am I making sense? What I'm what I'm saying, sort yeah, of. Yeah, ish. You're trying to create clarity between you and the and and that one listener, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the presentation theatrics and the more fun stuff is a way to do that, but at some point it goes over the line, becomes more of a clogging of the well pipe. you have to doze it you have to doze it and you ha- it has to be pertinent to the presentation right? It, right it's here to emphasize and enhance some of the parts of your presentation it is not all of your presentation a, a minor note also is that even though presentations that are successful are most often kind of like a story sometimes it's better to just get to the point at the very beginning so like People don't really enjoy, um, people don't enjoy it if they don't understand where they're going too much. A little bit of suspense and anticipation, totally fine, right? But not too much. So if a person starts talking and they start at the very beginning, and again, it's one step, two step, three, four, five step. At some point, I'm like, okay, but where are we going here? I'm just kind of confused and lost. So sometimes it's actually best if the first slide or the first whatever is just, here's the thing. Look at it for a second. Okay, now let's dive into the journey of this thing. You know what I mean? Sort right, of. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, and also it gives, again, context for the person to see where we're going. Like, okay, eventually I know we're going to get to this image that I've now seen. Without so in the case of a building, an overall rendering or whatever. Okay, there's the object, there's the thing, I get it. I see how it's situated on the site, it does this or that. Okay, cool. Now that is what I use to think against every time I see a new slide. If I don't have that, I'm just like, Where are we in the ocean here? It's we're just a, going every it, which way and I guess we're gonna end up somewhere interesting. I don't know. Well it's like when you start reading a book and the book starts with the end of the story. Sure. Or you start watching a movie. Foreshadowing maybe. Yeah, um, and there is like a kind of a, a fast forward scene that happens at the beginning and you're like, oh, okay, I know that Susan is going to get kidnapped. Right. I don't know when, so right. now I'm in suspense. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> she gets in the cab, I'm like, that's yeah, yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you she's know? in the background. Oh, wow. Okay, maybe this is it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that's, mm-hmm. you know, I just speak loud. Yeah. 
like you go to presentation and people are, are either mumbling or they're not articulating or they're being too quiet or the microphone doesn't work and it's like just you know just 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 get loud already and sort it out man yeah i'm not one to talk figure but it out really yeah as an audience member i feel it's my duty in in certain instances when i can to let them know that they're not doing it right you know if i'm in the audience as a big lecture that's one thing but if i'm in a small room setting and something's not right and i am not and i have a certain amount of authority there i'll just say stop don't you know don't start yet you don't sit there you move, I'll, I'll fucking be the one to curate because it's like why why don't we do that what if you're the teacher you mean? You, uh, even then i feel like everyone should you do go it. to a lecture and you're like what what wait a minute wait a minute you over there move you have nothing to do with the guy who's yeah or, or maybe not that but it's like you know you're t i can't hear you speak up you know, because it's like, what are we going to not say anything in the sit through an hour and a half so of like I, someone I, I can't understand? So I appreciate when like people have the courage to like say that out loud, you know, when there is a, an assembly of, of people in the audience. I always hate the tone at which they say it. So it's like, hey, I can't hear you. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like they're complaining. I'm like, well, the person know doesn't them. know they can hear you. <laughs> yeah. So you could say it very yeah. nicely. I don't know. It just gives it's the true. wrong tone. I'm it's like, true. It's always you know, a... like, like, hey, excuse me, sir. Like, we can hear you in the back. Could you like speak yeah, up? I, I or know, your I microphone's know, off? Or I know what you're you know, saying. it's always great when someone says that, and then the person goes, click, 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 click. Can you hear me now? No, can't hear you. Click, 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 click. Can you hear me now? Yeah, fine. <laughs> and then everyone in the audience is like, oh, <laughs> great. It's, it's that be kind a of long day. Long Apparently, we had pancakes in the morning. Now we're not doing anything. This was happening. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, uh. All right, so moving on to the, the last bits, content. Um, a long time ago, I saw a video by this man named Simon Sinek, who is a, apparently he's a motivational speaker. He's done a number of books and he has a YouTube station, what, very famous. Mm -hmm. um, the video that I saw was, I think, a portion of his TED Talk, I think. And I think the title was something like how to sell things. I don't know. But the golden circle was the principle. The golden circle, as he explains it, I don't know if it's something he invented either, but there's concentric circles and you start from the center and you work out. It's a conceptual thing. The center is why, then there's the how, and then the what. Mm -hmm. And his, everyone should look it up. I think it's worthwhile. I'm not saying every presentation in the world should follow this. As we just said previously, sometimes you need to start with the what so it's people aren't kind of frustrated. But generally, um, I think the things he says applies to a lot of stuff. At the very least, it's insightful. And he, he for him, he talks about selling products. He talks about like why Apple was successful versus other companies. He talks about the commercials, um, their commercials, focusing on the why, not the how and not the what, right? And generally, I think that's how most successful presentations work, is the why, how, and the what. Because if you have the why, you've piqued interest, they're engaged, they want to know how it happened, how it's going to work, take them through that, and then the big reveal is the what. And uh, at least in terms of, again, educating a uh, younger designer, start there, right? It's great to question the presentation, to question the why, how, what, and do things differently, but maybe you should learn the basic form of communication to tell a convincing story first, then you can start doing whatever different versions of that. Well, and those are but the that's... three points that needs answer. Like, you know, yeah. you cannot present a, a project or building without it because otherwise people just don't, don't understand it. You know, it's basic information. One of the projects I had worked on well, was at an office and we had put in all this work for this thing and we were super excited. We knew it was good. It had all these components, the why, why, how, and what, which is another lens to critique a project of any kind design, architecture, anything, why, how, what. And um, they, were, they had put together this presentation slideshow for the unveiling of this thing, and they had done the what first. So they, they, the presentation had a bunch of slides and facts and figures and whatever, and there was also like a maybe a 60-second video with music uh, showing renderings and kind of zooming in and out of this piece, right? And um, a lot of us in the office, I think we envisioned that happening at the end as kind of the celebratory reveal to get kind of more detailed with it. And they decided, actually, I don't remember in the end, I don't, I don't know what happened, but at some point we were discussing the presentation and they had a ver there was a version where that happened at the very beginning. No words, nothing said yet, 
right? Just this video with music in the background. And the music was a, 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 a found song. So I wasn't explaining anything. And I remember sitting there and I was like, oh, is it just me or is this like ultra boring? Because if I'm pretending to be a person who doesn't know this project, I have no reason to care about what I'm saying. Yeah, there's some cool forms and things like that, sure. But the premise of the project and the whole reason for it exists and the reason why it was created for the project, but also the context of, of, of other things, there's, the, there's had, had to be a backstory to it, right? That's the premise. That there was a big part of why this was done. And you're starting off with the final thing. And I remember thinking, this is just, even as a person who did this, I'm like utterly bored by it, right? I have no reason right. to care. Um, so that's why I think starting with the why is important because you have to give a reason to, for people to care. That's how we start every um, every single project in school in France. I think was like what we call the problematic. You mm -hmm. have to problematize mm -hmm. your project. Right, right. You right. can just like pick a topic or a theme. Mm -hmm. There has to be a question around it, and your project is trying to answer that question. So it's not just having a concept, it's having a, a problematic. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. I, it makes total sense. It makes total sense. And that's a great way to think about a presentation or in almost any point you're trying to drive is that you can't sell something unless there's a problem, right? And again, it could be a, a problem that's strongly in the negative or it could be something that's neutral and you're trying to improve. It doesn't matter. You're changing a situation and I need to be convinced that this change needs to happen. And I think it, when we say prob like problematic in, in French, it's not necessarily negative. Mm -hmm. It is more like you're putting a question onto something. Right. You're, right. you're you know, like you're putting a question on a concept or on an idea. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, it, and maybe the question is how, maybe the question is why, or but you you are questioning the idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that when we we allow, well, I mean, there are some presentations that are just about the how, right? And that's different. Like if we're, if we're doing a tutorial on how to, I don't know, fucking carve wood or something. It's about skill set. There's a how. The why is a little less relevant in that case, but you know, um, that's a very particular kind of lecture, I would say, and that's probably not what we're talking about because there's not much to do. There, speak clearly, have get clear instructions. And that's it. That's all you need. Right. But to convince someone of a new idea, different, different ball game. Some other small notes. You know, lately I've been thinking that one of the most convincing ways to well, one of the, one of the most successful ways to convince someone of something is to use an an, an analogy. If if you can make a comparative story that they buy that story, they're like, yeah, I know that story, I know that situation, I would totally do that in that situation. And then you tell them, it's very much like what we're doing over here. The it's 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 almost like a shortcut in logic. Did you like my analogy of the premature presenter being an uncooked egg? <laughs> I found it mostly disturbing, if I'm being honest. I didn't understand. It is what, what that my meant. COVID life <laughs> has been teaching me. Um, it takes 13 minutes to cook an egg. <laughs> <laughs> right, and then it blows up. Yeah, no, uh, no. I, I, again, I think it's about giving it that that uh, personal dimension mm -hmm. to a presentation. You know, by giving. Uh, like you said, an energy, anecdotes, stories, p painting pictures in people's mind, right? It's just just trying not to be a book, a speaking book, mm -hmm. being like being a little more than that, right? A little more colorful. I think also if you're trying to convince someone of a different idea, you're asking them to step outside of what their their comfort zone a certain way, right? right. Their mind is, is uh, you're asking them to stretch their mind. So if you can kind of do that in the process of the presentation through analogy, maybe it's easier for them to kind of, you know, fall into a new uh, way of thinking. Right, right, sort right. Sort of, right. you know, you're hopping over to different ways of thinking that are, that are different because they don't belong in the presentation, the topic, but they exist already so they buy into it. Or let's say you're presenting something to a client that is fairly conceptual or right. maybe not down to earth that they might not get it. If you use another easier picture for them to understand, then that's it. They won't get stuck and you can move on with your presentation. Yeah. So I think analogies, anecdotes also very powerful. Another very particular 
pet peeve of mine is it's really not a good idea to reference a bunch of hyper specific you know even esoteric things in a presentation if you're the if the audience is not meant to be learning about it and and i know that when it comes to more mm, not technical heavy topics thick topics or things that rely on a lot of uh rely on history that's difficult because you want to cite things but you know if no one in the audience knows the person then it has zero meaning in right. that moment right zero zero meaning it's like when I call my sister and she's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to meet Susan and Bobby yeah. and and uh, yeah. John. And I'm like, well, who are these people? Your are they sister your friend, lives your in, doctor? In, 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 <laughs> south, in, in the southern parts of the United States, it seems like, and not France, if they're meeting Susie, Bobby, and John. Oh, they're Americanized in oh, France now, okay. you know. You know, frontiers have opened. People have traveled and, and moved around the world. Infecting everyone. Infecting um, everyone. Here's an interesting thing, too, is, is that if you're giving a presentation or you're making a presentation and you find that you're not successful in giving it or in making it, um, it could be that, you know, there's nerves involved and stuff like you that. you suck. <laughs> but it, it could be that you suck at giving presentations. But it very also likely means... But your project sucks. ...that your project is not good. It is a sad truth. It is a That truth. is why it is important to think about presentation during the process of the project which might sound like okay well who has time to like start thinking about the presentation when i'm not even done with my project yeah that's true but you know just like clarity for yourself would yeah. help clarify and advance the project well, really when you're making a presentation you're thinking about it from someone else's perspective that's kind of the first definition of creating a presentation i would say so that's really more what it's about you know, it's filling in the gaps that you don't perceive because because you have tunnel vision and you have certain biases, right? This is also why I keep I'm always saying you should write stuff down because you're putting it externally, right? You're making the you're making this thing out in the world and you critique it from a different perspective. When you don't when designers don't write anything down and they don't make a presentation and they just wing it, you're just assuming that whatever is in your head is totally correct. And that's like a terrible <laughs> assumption to make. In fact it's it's kind of arrogant and and very dangerous i would actually say um so making a presentation early on is a way to make sure that you're it's, it's a way to test yourself actually it's a way to make sure that you're not you're not allowing your own assumptions take over which they will and that's where like you know going back to students i feel like a lot of the recent students i've encountered they don't use the opportunities of small presentation, like informal desk scripts, mm. as much as they should. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like, well, I'm just showing you what I have right now. And it might be the purpose of a desk script. Like, I don't know, I'm from another country. But if I have the opportunity to talk to my teacher and right. my classmates for like half an hour, 15 minutes about my projects, I should prepare. Like I, yeah. should, I should have an outline. I should have things I want to cover. And not having that, is ultimately not preparing you for the big presentation. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. You know, it's like the, the, those, those, those desk scripts are not just about the project. They're actually not even about the project. They're about your process and they're about how you're communicating it. Oh, yeah. Sell it to me. Right? That's totally true. And that... No, but that's, we, we, and that's, we're, where, we're that's do... where students get confused and that's where teachers are not good at well, redirecting yeah. them. Oh. Is yes. that everybody just focus on the pretty thing at the end, but really it's it's all of the other skills you have to develop when you're doing this project. Are you sure you don't want to teach design? I probably confused the shit out of the students. So. But you're 100% <laughs> correct, and we're going to do another recording about teaching design and probably one about critiquing projects. Oh, That's God, the most... we're never going to be out of school. I know. We're trying to get out of it. We're trying to wrap things up. But we that's the... Um, that's the biggest fucking mistake that people make. It's like they talk about the thing... But they don't talk about the thing making the thing. You know, talk about the person. Help the person. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that Help is why, the creator. And that is what my fifth year thesis project taught me with the teacher I had was it didn't really matter that much what the thing was looking like at the end. Like, of course, I had to be happy with, you know, the design I, I was going for. But it was really much more about the, the process and the journey and how it's communicating to people. Mm. Presentation is all about communication. If you do not know how to communicate, you are not going to be a good presenter. Yeah, and if you don't know how to, if you can't communicate it 
you know, with a good amount of sleep and rehearsal, then you don't have a good design. If you have nothing to say about your design, your design's probably not good. Uh, like a 99.9999% chance. And if you're the 0.0001%, you just got lucky. You know, you have to be also thinking about, you have to also be asking the question is, am I setting up a process that's repeatable so I can consistently create new and interesting and different and profound whatever, whatever things? Uh, and luck doesn't count. I'm sorry. You know, I played around and this happened. Doesn't count. So does not, does not, it's not anything. Pork dumplings. <laughs> All right. Uh, last few points. I think we already went over this stuff, actually. I think also going back to being honest, is something, if you're in the room and you're presenting and something weird's going on, it's perfectly fine to get to step outside of the presentation role and acknowledge there's something weird going on. Like, it's, it's super awkward. And I think it's strange when someone's talking and a phone goes off and it keeps going off and we all just try to pretend like, it's this not, is happening. not happening. Yeah. It rings once, then yeah, it's going to be shut off. We, we assume it's going to be silence, but it goes over. It's like, no, acknowledge the thing yeah. in the room. Like, there's this weird kind of the is it pretense is that, that working. We, like, yeah, not... <laughs> there's this thing that we have when there's presentations. It's like, oh, we can't talk about what's actually happening anymore. We have to build this illusion the... of reality. It's like, you're selling an illusion, yes, but we're just people in a room, really. Yeah. You know, and in fact, you being dishonest and not acknowledging what's going on is making it weird. And I'm not listening to you anymore because I'm focusing on whatever yeah. thing's going on. Um, <laughs> Preparation. You know, I was saying that you write down your, your presentation speech without memorizing it like a robot. But you could definitely make cards, you know, like note cards with some of the things you want to mention. If you feel like what's on the board isn't enough for you, right? right? Or you don't want to turn and face the board. Or you don't want to, yeah, face away to from... look at, the, yeah, show your back to the audience. The, yeah, uh, you, I mean, if you're if, if if you're facing the audience, that's great, but you still have to reference the board somehow. I've seen people like completely ignore what's on the wall. It's it's kind of weird. The funny thing with notes is that every time I've had notes. Most of the time, they aren't good notes because I don't spend enough time prepping. You don't know how to make And notes. they're really, really long. Like bullet points, keywords, not, yeah. colors, fonts, like yeah. order. This is, again, like an abstract, streamed outline. If I'm being honest, I prefer to just wing it. <laughs> no, but you know, for me, for example, having the notes, I like having them because it's like my, my backup. I know. Like if I'm stuck, but it's all in my head. It's just pure stress, stress management, you know, relief. But here's the funny thing, and I, I'm sure this happens with with most people, um, and I'll tell it through a story. So we had a, a close friend of ours in high school. Uh, this was back when I was in high... I was in college? They were in high school. I forget. Whatever. It was high school science fair. Do you have those in France? No. Okay. So it's high school science fair. You guys make everything an event. We, <laughs> we, don't, do. we don't do that. It's France. always a fair. There's always you a raffle. Suffer, you just <laughs> suffer through school. You know, you get shit great. Teachers are mean to How you. How many raffles can we create? It's a raffle for Halloween or a raffle for Oktoberfest. Um, there is a, a science fair and, you know, the science fair, all the kids put up their little boards and they're like, I grew mold out of a flower. I put dye in a flower. <laughs> it's the so stupid cool. things, right? And we were helping out a close family friend because she's participating in the school science fair. I'd never given a presentation before. And it's a big thing for a student. Actually, it's a good thing because they, it's a new format to be giving, to be judged, right? And to have to put, put out your ideas. We call and, that an ex expose in French. Right. I and always stressed out for the theater next <laughs> they're, they're very stressful. But what's interesting about them in that format is that you get to re do the speech numerous times. Right right, right, right. But anyway, so she's like super nervous and she has her note cards and she's there. She does her things and, and presentations and whatnot. Science fair ends and she had all these beautiful note cards, super clearly written, right? Comes out of it and she's like, how'd it go? How'd it go? She's like, I looked down at my note cards and I saw nothing. <laughs> mean to say, you're so nervous, you look down and even though you wrote it and even though it's clear and in color, you're so nervous you can't read anything and you just see either literally nothing or you see random words that look like they're you know written in some foreign language so every time i've had notes that happens to me because i'm in the moment i'm saying stuff you know whatever and i get a little bit lost okay i'm looking at my notes 
Okay, let me just wing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every t- time, every time that happens, no, it's I know, like, okay, because, but because forget it. it. Because it is hard. Whatever. <laughs> but I think the notes are good to have. Don't try and look at them. Just have right. them in your pocket to reassure you. But the notes are super helpful right before you jump on stage before presentation. Yeah, it's true. Because it's just a little refresher yep. of all your stuff. And it's, you know, it's like you go for an exam, you go take a, take an exam for school for like your licensing exam or whatever. Well, maybe you have like a couple of things you kind of want to get in last minute because it's going to be fresh in your brain and that's good, but not too much. Don't bring the like 80 pages presentation thing. Yeah, of you know? course, of course. Uh, you know, I, I just, I just think that go, because you want to be, uh, you want to make it sound like it's improvised or you want to make it sound like it, it is extemporaneous, right? And then more honest and et cetera, et cetera. And it's so hard to go from that to like looking down at the podium at your notes. Yeah, no, that's so what I'm I, saying. Don't, don't look at it, um, but okay. have it with you. <laughs> okay. For, for what purpose then? <laughs> Just for, for preparation. But for preparation, okay. I think, yeah. you know, the night before, the morning off, like it, it's good. You know, the funny thing is every time that happens to me, which is almost in every presentation where I do have notes, I look down and I realize it's not going to help me. And I, I don't literally throw it, but in my mind, I throw it and I go, whatever. And I, for some reason, I envision Matthew McConaughey and he's saying, all right, all right, all right. Like, just fucking let's just get it on. Let's just see what happens. I don't know why I think that, but I do. It helps. There's a little Matthew it McConaughey on your shoulder. Probably doesn't saying, help. All right, all yeah, right, he's all on right. your shoulder. He's the devil. Let's just get it. Let's just, <laughs> let's just wing it, baby. Let's see what happens. Um, but one, uh, I think, final note that I really have is second to last note is uh if you can somehow keep track of how much time you have left that's also that's super helpful one. um because you're nervous and you tend to rush you will rush when you think you're running when you're running out of time and you always feel like you're running out of time as soon as that thought comes in it could come in after 30 seconds or after 10 minutes it doesn't matter now you feel like you have to you know fly through things and um you know that's that's not a I it's best if you can have an iPhone with your do not disturb on with a big circle. That's actually really, 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 really oh, helpful. Oh yeah, that's smart. I was um, gonna say have a little clock or something on the, the desk you're setting up your stuff. Makes something a big that's not a watch, so you don't show the audience that you are keeping track of time. Mm-hmm. You know, it's more like a little glimpse and you kinda know where you're at and you're not disturbing the magic of the presentation. The magic of the presentation. Yeah. That's interesting. I've I've always seen that when people are giving presentations and I'm in charge of keeping track of time and let's say they have eight minutes and I tell them you have three minutes left, two minutes left. The perception they always have is that two minutes is 30 seconds right. and they rush through. I'm like, you actually don't realize, and it's also the opposite of true a lot of times too, right. but you know, you don't realize that two minutes is actually a fair amount of time. But that's why it's important to rehearse, not just uh, for rehearsing. Sp- for speech, but just so you know how long what you wrote and what you want to say it's going to take. Mm-hmm. Because you might have to cut back or you might have to develop a little bit more, you know? Like, it's also a pretty awful experience when somebody's presenting at a final jury and they're like, done way before the timer goes off it's kind of like well that's all you have to say yeah. like come on like you know scratch it into something on the project like, sure sure lightweights and not, most of the time it's because they just didn't do the work and put in the effort and that's not anyone's fault but theirs so you know <laughs> uh no sympathy um the very last thing I, I, idea that i kind of was thinking is that you know there's like more formal settings and there's more conversational settings and it tends to be the formal ones are when you're trying to win and the conversational ones are when you're trying to learn but i don't know more and more lately i've been just convinced by the idea that it's just it's more productive to just have a conversation rather than be pitching all the time um i i think it's also maybe a, a more successful way of of winning um, too. But you know, I think it comes from, um, you know, the whole society we live in right now, where we're being pitched all the time, you know, everywhere we go, everything we're on, like it's a pitch, it's a pitch, it's like a, uh, a line, you know, a tagline, something, the punchline that has to captivate you right away. And it's exhausting. Right, right. It's exhausting, right? And I think we're all looking for more authenticity, more honesty, more 
resonance between people and, and, and experiences and things we can relate to more. Right. So, yeah, I would totally agree that I mean, you could win it by just being conversational, too. I think so. I think I think some of us are interested in that. I don't know how this just translates. I think we're going to wrap it up. After, this is a long recording. Wrap it up after this one. Um, you know, one of the previous episodes you were we were talking. I don't know who said it, it was you or me, but it was the idea that not everything can be communicated in a single statement. Right. So if I'm going to make a statement and that lasts, I don't know, five sentences, there's probably a whole lot to that, to the reasons why I'm saying it, to how I actually feel that are not being communicated. Yeah, that's what you said earlier today. Did I, to, in, on the podcast? You said I might say yes, but there is more nuance to it, to my answer than that. I said that on the podcast? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, you got tired and hungry. You're quitting yourself now? <laughs> <laughs> I, heard this, I heard this person say one time on this very reputable podcast. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, and this, this gets to other things too of how we all communicate these days. But I think that's a very important thing for everyone to realize. And it, it, it also applies to presentation. You can't put everything in a presentation, right? Allow some of the stuff to be in the Q&A because not all information belongs at the top. Not everything's a headline. Not everything's a, not, not everything's a one line, big pitch, whatever. There's subtleties to it, right? And there's hierarchy and there's remainders. There's other ideas that, that are kind of on the periphery, but are important. And you have to recognize that there is that hierarchy of, of, of thought and how everyone feels and communicates. And that applies, I think, to many things, including presentations. That is a beautiful way to wrap it up. Yes. All right, everybody. This is the Midnight Charette Podcast. We appreciate you listening. If you liked this recording, then um, do us a uh, favor or, sup or support the show by leaving a review on iTunes. We are also on Spotify. <laughs> They need to put reviews on Spotify because it is we have weird. so many yeah. listeners on Spotify. I know. Um, we're also on Spotify on YouTube for all the guest episodes, pretty much. YouTube for all of these tips episodes and sometimes for the more fun ones. And what else about the show that do they need to know? All of our episodes are available on our website, website as well. Yep. We mm -hmm. are on all the social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Yep. Instagram. Uh, we we have a hotline. If you want to react, if you have other things you want to know about a presentation, other things you have experienced with presentation, or you just want to say you enjoyed this episode, you can call or text our hotline number, which is 213-222-6950. Shoot us a text. We'll cover it on the show. Or, you know, if you have a question, we can help you out individually if we if that we have time. <laughs> Sound good? Sounds good. All right, everybody. Thanks again for listening. And we'll talk to you again next week or sooner. Bye. Bye-bye.